Alpha Day and good morning. Welcome everyone to the Guam Congress building. The Committee on Health, Land, Justice and Culture is now called to order. Today's Friday, February 3, 2023, and the time is 9.08 a.m. Today's committee meeting with the Department of Public Health and Social Services and the 37th Guam Legislature's Committee on Health is being held at my invitation. We look forward to working with the Department of Public Health and Social Services to address key issues and support agency objectives and goals. So this is our first meeting of our new term and uh, in the new year, so Happy New Year to all of you. I, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of my colleagues today, uh, Senator Roy Kanata, Senator Tello Taitugui, and Senator Tom Fisher. Pursuant to the Open Government Law, committee meetings other than hearings are not required to be conducted in public. However, this committee meeting has been publicly noticed for public accessibility and the notices were published in the Guam Daily Post and the Government of Guam Public Notice Portal on Friday, January 27, and again on Wednesday, February 1, 2023. It is being live streamed on the Guam Legislature's YouTube channel and on GTA TV Channel 21 and Docomo Channel 117 or 112.4. Notices were also distributed via email to all senators and media broadcasting outlets on the same days. I'd also like to recognize the presence of my colleague, Senator Chris Barnett. Department of Public Health and Social Services uh, will uh, give us a presentation based on a letter that I sent to them uh, with a, a list of items that I'd like the legislature to be updated on to go forward. It's of course not everything that public health is working on and uh, just in the interest of time, we limited it to several categories. I'm, I'm afraid there were quite a few categories still, and so this might take a little while, but I want to thank everyone for their patience in advance. And we have, I'd also like to recognize Senator Will Parkinson. Thank you, Senator. So we will allow the entire presentation, and I want to thank Public Health for the work that they've done on this. They, they have a PowerPoint presentation for us this morning. And so, and we were able to give copies of that to all the senators, so I'm very grateful for the, that preparation in advance. So some of the agenda items that uh, we listed in the letter to public health include progress in maximizing utilization of SNAP, Medicaid benefits, plans to expand Medicaid eligibility. And BOSA, or the Bureau of Social S Services, uh, the status of CPS referrals, crisis response. The status of Gumamina Aussie Shelter for Children, the operations and the staffing. An update on the $5 million appropriation pursuant to Public Law 36-9 for sole purpose of providing food commodities. The status of full operations of community health centers to include nursing services and the central clinic. Division of Environmental Health, Operational Issues with Processing of Health Certificates. Employee Pandemic Overtime from April 2022 to January 2023. I um, want to thank again all of you from Public Health for your work in advance, and I would like to ask the Director if you could please introduce your team and, and you may proceed with your uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker and Committee Chair for the Committee on Health, members of the 37th Guam Legislature and your committee members, Senator Parkinson, Senator Kanata, Senator Tidegui, Senator Fisher, and Senator Barnett. Good morning and half a day. I'm Arthur Sanagasi, the Director of Public Health and Social Services. And as the speaker very clearly stated, um, there are seven items that we will be presenting to you today. And I brought my team, they're assembled here so they could work, as they work with us, they could also be here. Should you have any questions after our presentation? But to start off, we have progress in maximizing utilization of SNAP, Medicaid benefits, plans to expand Medicaid eligibility. For that presentation, I have the acting chief for the Division of Public Welfare, who is Mr. Carlos Pangolinan. And also with him and his team is Dan Burrito. You want to like wave a little? Dan Burrito, Christine Sinicholas, Terry Gumatauta, Jeff Sinicholas, and <clears throat> Mike Gallo. Thank you, guys. Uh, with BASA on CPS referrals and crisis response, we have the acting chief for the Division of Children's Wellness. We have Tricia Moffness 
and with her is Crystal Gooden, and they're both from the Division of Children's Wellness, and Crystal is with the Bureau of Social Services Administration. She is their social service supervisor, too. And on the status of Iguma Minaazi Shelter for Children, operations and staffing, we again will have the Acting Chief of the Division of Public Children's Wellness, Trish Moffness, present on that as well. The update of the $5 million appropriation pursuant to Public Law 36-9 for sole purpose of providing food and commodities, that assignment was given to the Division of Public Welfare and Mr. Carlos Pengalina, and again, along with Deputy Director Terry Ogden, will present on that update. The status of the full operations of community health centers to include nursing services and central clinic. We have with us this morning our newly hired, three weeks on the job, Dr. Melissa Young. So she's welcome on board as a CHC CEO, and she'll be taking the lead in presenting the status of the operations of the community health center. Following her presentation, we have Margarita Gay, who is the administrator for the Bureau of Family Health and Nursing Services. And she's accompanied by Maggie Bell, who is a program coordinator with the Maternal Child Health Program. And one of the programs Mrs. Gay, Administrator Gay, oversees. And they'll be presenting on the central clinic operations. For the, the DEH operational issues or processing of health certificates, we have Mr. Tom Nadeau. He's the Chief Administrator for the Division of Environmental Health. And accompanying him this morning is Esther Figger, and she's a supervisor for the Customer Service Rep section of the Division of Environmental Health. And last but not least is the employee pandemic overtime from April 22nd to January 2023. And we have with us uh, not so new, but recent transfer to the Department of Public Health, Mr. Kim Blas. He is officially with us and he is overseeing our general administration operations, which includes our finance, includes human really, uh, resource, HR, and general admin of the overall operations of the day-to-day -day of the director's office. And so with that, I do wanna Thank you all for the meeting, this opportunity where we can present with you where we are with these seven items, but also I, I do take uh, notice of the speaker's comments and we too would like to work very collaboratively with you speaker, your committee, and all members of the 37th Guam Legislature. And we do definitely need your support in our operations of the Department of Public Health and Social Services in terms of meeting our objectives and our goals. And as a speaker also, you noted, yes, if we took all of the programs of public health and social services and did a presentation, we'll probably need a week long with you all because we have a multitude of programs. We have the Division of Environmental Health, we have the Division of Children's Wellness, the Division of Senior Citizens, the Division of Public Welfare, and the Division of Public Health as five primary divisions. To add on to that, we have the Division of General Admin. So we do have a myriad, a multitude of programs and so definitely uh, we are very open to other items in the future that we would like to discuss with your body and the speaker and your members of your committee and the overall body of the 37th Guam Legislature. Good morning, Senator Brown. Thank you for uh, joining Public Health Orientation Committee meeting. We always appreciate your support as well. So on that note, I will then like to start the presentation because we do have quite a bit here to present of information and you do have the slides and we hope that it provides the information you are seeking and perhaps answers some of your questions. And perhaps we can then meet at a later time if there are additional items or questions to be addressed. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker and members of the 37th Guam Legislature. And on that, if I can call on Mr. Carlos Pangolinan to start our presentation. I'm sorry, if I may, if I, may I just wanted to also recognize Margaret Agolta, she is with our finance management section where Mr. Kin Blas is the oversight manager, administrator, and I just want to make sure that I also take time to recognize her presence. And I, I believe, Deputy Lori, I almost forgot. My deputy on the right side, <laughs> she is here, and she oversees the Division of Environmental Health and Division of Public Health. And Deputy Terry, Deputy Terry Ogden, Deputy Lauren Duenas. Deputy Terry oversees the Division of Children's Wellness, Division of Senior Citizens and Division of Public Welfare. Thank you, and at that time, um, th sorry about that, deputies. Uh, but Carlos, if you would, let's start our presentation. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Senators. My name is Carlos Pangolinan. Um, I'm the Acting Chief of the Division of Public Welfare. And uh, what we were asked to do was to kind of uh, talk about um, expansion of our SNAP and Medicaid programs. Uh, however, uh, at this point in time, I don't have anything in terms of SNAP expansion, uh, but we will do an overview of both programs, and then we will talk a little bit about uh, expansion of Medicaid. Um, I don't know if you have access to our slides, but we do have a presentation 
Yeah, okay. So uh, if we could go to the next slide. So um, just to kind of go over what uh, SNAP is, uh, Supplemental Nutrition uh, Assistance Program, um, <clears throat> first established in 1977. This is really uh, what used to be known and referred to as the Food Stamp Program. Uh, there have been uh, changes since, um, and basically what this program does is it, it provides nutrition assistance, and basically uh, food uh, items and, and so forth for low-income individuals and families. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, so I'll, we'll just go ahead and, and go over some of the general eligibility requirements to be on our program. Uh, usually it is for uh, U.S. citizens. However, uh, we have non-U.S. citizens uh, or permanent resident aliens, rather, that have, under certain conditions, can qualify for SNAP, uh, such as uh, living in the U.S. for a number of years, also uh, like with Social Security, you have uh, um, working quarters, 40 of them. Um, we also have, uh, in some instances, you don't necessarily have to be a permanent resident. You could be in a, a seeking asylum, and you may qualify for SNAP uh, without even meeting any of the, re the requirements for a permanent resident alien. Uh, but generally speaking, we're, we're all familiar with SNAP EBT, which is the card uh, such as the Quest card that is used by the program, but it's a benefit, and uh, we have um, we have uh, <clears throat> income thresholds uh, depending on the type of uh, household you have, number of people. But just to give you one example, a household of two people with a gross income of a uh, little less than two thousand dollars would qualify for an allotment of seven hundred and sixty-one dollars a month. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So, you know, what does this mean to you uh, and to our community uh, in the aggregate sense? Um, last fiscal year, uh, we issued about $146.5 million in benefits. The monthly average of, the, of this program, that equates to about $12 million per month. The impact is on 26,593 households. The average issuance per household is about $460, depending on their criteria. And uh, we're looking at roughly 73,316 recipients. So it's, it's, a, it's a fairly substantial program that affects the community, uh, provides benefits to people who need it. Next slide, please. Um, with the emergency, uh, with the uh, <clears throat> PHE, the public health uh, emergency, through that period, uh, there has been additional benefits that were given to our SNAP clients. Uh, started in uh, March 2020, the average monthly issuance on top of the 12 mil is about 2.8 million. And this uh, expires with the federal funding um, at the end of this month. Uh, next, we will start talking about general information about Medicaid. Medicaid is uh, it, it's it's uh, like health insurance, uh, unlike Medicare, which is fully funded by the federal, which is federal, but purely federal funds that cover Medicare. Uh, this is a joint state and federal program. So, sure. I'm I, sorry, um, I was, if we could just go back to the uh, previous slide, emergency allotment, what was the necessity for an emergency allotment? Uh, well, the necessity of the emergency allotment. Christine, you wanna talk about that? Yeah. I'll have, um, Ms. Nicholas, our bureau head for no. why, why was there an emergency allotment? So the emergency allotment basically is additional SNAP benefits uh, because due to the pandemic. 
So families were getting like additional $95 per, um, per, uh, per household uh, per month. And the process is, is that when the, when the local public health emergency is initiated, executive order, we have to submit official requests to FNS to request for this additional funding. So it's just a supplement on top of what they're actually getting. I guess that's my question. That's my question. Um, what was the necessity for the supplement? I mean, that was, that was prior to the consumer price index going up to 8.1%. I mean, the question is, why did they need? Why did people need an additional outlay? So, so basically, of course, because of the, the pandemic, um, a lot of people had lost their jobs. So, knowing that they weren't getting enough money to purchase foods for their family, um, of course, the federal government felt that it was a need in order to help our families kind of kind of stay on their feet until the pandemic ended or until they were able to find employment. Were these people otherwise eligible for SNAP benefits? Yes, yes they were, correct. They're only given to those that are eligible. They are, they are given to those that are SNAP eligible only. Thank you. Okay. I'm gonna ask, uh, if we could, we're gonna hold, try to hold our questions until the end, just because this is a long presentation. I wanna get through it all and then we'll, we'll ask all the questions you want. Thank you. Um, if you could go back to the next slide. Um, next, so um, so Medicaid has some eligibility requirements, same as SNAP. Uh, generally, uh, U.S. citizens uh, with no residency requirement, um, permanent resident aliens or green card holders living in the U.S. for at least five years can qualify. And uh, recently, we've been able to have uh, our COFA migrants participate in Medicaid, uh, which was not the case uh, a year ago. Um, and uh, just to give you an example of a benefit, a household of three, well, someone who would rather qualify, not a benefit, but household of three uh, with an income not to exceed $2,700 per month. So it's income-based as well. Next slide. So last fiscal year, uh, roughly $154 million in claims were paid through Medicaid. Of that amount, uh, about $19 million was financed uh, by the taxpayers of Guam. So it's, it's a federally matching program and I'm sorry, 173 million in total claims were paid, of which 154 was by the federal government and 19, 19 million by the, uh, Guam. And we are looking at close to 50,000 participants in Medicaid. So next I'm gonna talk about expansion, which is something that was a part of the inquiry from um, the speaker. So when we think of um, <clears throat> expansion uh, of Medicaid, we can look at it two ways. We can look at it in terms of, of increasing the number of eligible participants, which for example, if we raise the income threshold that would result in more people being eligible, so that's expansion. The other way of expanding Medicaid um, could be by uh, expanding or improving the services uh, in terms, not just in terms of type of services that we can cover, or even in terms of the number of providers that are part of our program um, with more providers me could be more options to the clients. So those are two ways of looking at expansion. And there have been a number of efforts to expand over the years, um, notably the uh, Obamacare uh, required some type of new programming, new eligibility. We had, over the years, we've had new eligibility uh, requirements that 
at expanded the number of people in the program as well as covering certain things that we might not have covered before. Next slide, please. So in expanding Medicaid, we have to work with our federal partners and we have to, you know, usually we would have to look at our state plan, Guam state plan, which dictates eligibility and the types of services and the reimbursement rates that we pay to the providers. And there are a number of things that, ha uh, that are involved in changing that. And we kind of have it listed here. So basically, if we wanted to increase a type of service or to cover something that we're not, we usually have to submit a state plan amendment or apply for some type of waiver. So we have to amend our state plan or apply directly to CMS for a waiver. And a waiver is usually something where there may be requirements by the federal government and uh, we want to waive from those requirements and offer something as an alternative. Um, states do this all throughout the country. And in any case, whether it's a state plan amendment or a waiver, uh, there, there, there are some things that we have to consider. Uh, one of them is budget impact, uh, budget neutrality, because all the states, I mean, well, in the CONUS or the, the mainland U.S., most states, uh, it's a, Medicaid is a true entitlement, meaning it didn't matter what their budget is. They're not subject to caps. The territories are subject to caps. So we actually get a grant award, and whatever we offer, whatever we pay for, has to not exceed that cap. It's the same thing for uh, U.S. Virgin Islands, CNMI, American Samoa, and so forth. So that's kind of like a constraint. So anything that we try to do to change our program, whatever we do, we can't not do it in a way where it would exceed what the federal government is already funding. Uh, of course, we have to look at uh, federal regulations. Oh, I'm sorry. And, I'll, and we all, there also, there's a lot of requirements in terms of transparency and public comment and so forth. <clears throat> Next slide. So here are some uh, things that we are looking at currently. Um, as you may be aware, there is a severe shortage of providers on Guam with, uh, or a projected shortage of providers in the uh, OBGYN services. Um, we are looking at possibly raising the reimbursement rates as a, an incentive to uh, entice uh, doc, uh, OBGYN doctors to stay on Guam or come to Guam or, you know, remain on Guam. And currently we are looking at possibly a $1.7 million impact to our program. Um, and right now we are working with CMS and our partners on how we can go about crafting a state plan amendment to do that. Another item that we're looking at, um, though we're, we're still in the preliminary phases of it, uh, we've been asked uh, by uh, different stakeholders in the community regarding um, services for disabilities and seniors, uh, personal care attendants, enhanced home health care, um, collaboration with, uh, so there's like collaboration with, with like, basically there, there are people in the community that have a, an interest in seeing s certain services have a, a higher reimbursement. So we're, we just need to look at those services specifically and see how it works in our state plan. And let me just go ahead and finish off the Medicaid section with this last. Um, so, you know, going back to what I talked about budget neutrality, um, particularly with the OBGYN services, with the public health emergency, um, there was a bump to all our providers, at least particularly for the physician services of about 10% of their, above their normal reimbursement. That's set to expire with the PHE and the projected cost of that uh, at the time that uh, was implemented was about 3.8 million. So if OBGYN reimbursement rates going up a certain percentage would cost about 1.7, 
that would be within the 3.8. So we're so we we we're budget neutral basically. Uh, but that's all I have for now. Um, it, and we can. Thank you very much, Carlos. At this time, I'd like to call on Trish Mockness, who is our acting chief for the Division of Children's <coughs> Smallness, to to present on the CPS referrals and responses and the crisis response. And because she also oversees the um, operation of Igima Minaasi, we just go in and have her proceed right into that presentation as well. Madam Speaker, that's all right? Okay. Thank you very much. Trish, if you would please. Thank you. Good morning, Senators. Um, I wanted to go ahead and give you a, a brief history of where CPS was and where we are today. Um, so can we go to the first slide? The next one. Okay, so Executive Order 2021-02 was enacted on January 21st, 2021. Um, that is relative to declaring an emergency regarding the operational state of the Child Protective Services. This was in response to information that in FY22, 1,142 referrals were reported and not addressed. Um, the executive order also addressed the need for additional staff by allowing fast track recruitment for social workers. It prioritized procurement needs for our group foster home. And um, at that time, DYA, D Department of Youth Affairs, served as temporary administrative custodian for CPS. Seven staff from DYA assisted with the daily CPS functions, and DYA then transitioned out of BOSA on August 8, 2022. Next slide, please. Um, so this chart shows um, a the breakdown of referrals that came into CPS from 2020 to current as of January 30, 2023. So if you see on the intake referrals on the first row, um, the cases in 2020 was 1,142. Today, to date, we have received 550 referrals and we project um, based on the average per month that we're projecting 1,650. Okay, um, so it also breaks down between crisis and investigation units and the case management unit. Um, what's important in this chart is to say that all incoming referrals to CPS have been assigned to the crisis and investigation units. So there are no pending referrals to be assigned. So that's where we are today. Um, that's a summary of the first inquiry that you sent to us, speaker. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move forward into the status of Guma Minaha, in a, sorry, a Guma Minaasi Shelter for Children. Next slide. Okay. So on September 15, 2021, um, the Department of Public Health and Social Services Bureau of Social Services Administration started operating the shelter. Currently, we have 15 staff, and that breaks down to two community program aid twos, 13 community program aid ones, um, that's 15, and we're actively um, interviewing and re to recruit five more positions, one social worker three to oversee the program, one CPA two, and three CPA ones. So that will be a total staffing of 20 personnel up there. Um, we also have, the operations include a food and supply blanket purchase agreement for $4,000 each for three different um, vendors on island so we can buy our food and necessities. We also have nursing and medication management provided weekly, um, daily actually at the shelter, um, provided by a nurse from the Division of Public Health. And then um, our staff are ongoing mental health training with Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center. And um, GWIBWIC is also providing weekly consultations um, to identify children who are eligible, eligible for the therapeutic shelter. We are also working with Guam Memorial Health to try and place some of our children with special health care needs, possibly at the skilled nursing unit or another plan, but we are working and discussing with them. 
but we are also working on our interest for bid to put out the shelter for contract services. Um, next slide. I wanted to give a snapshot of our quarter end occupancy for the shelter. Um, like I said, we started in September of 2021, so that's the bottom of the graph where at the end of the month we had six for the quarter. But today, as um, currently, we have 28 children in the shelter. There is an increasing need for placement for our children. And that will complete my presentation. Thank you. Okay, and the, uh, the next area of discussion is the Division of Public Welfare Food and Commodities. At this time, I'll call Carlos Pangalinen and, of course, myself as well. Slide, please. So, um, just to give a, a, a general background for those of us who are not familiar with this program, the Food and Commodities Grant, this is a locally funded program. Um, which uh, our, our speaker introduced um, several years ago, or about a year or so ago. Uh, and this is right in the middle of the uh, pandemic. Uh, but in any case, in uh, a bill was passed which identified um, savings that would have resulted uh, from a bond refinance refinancing uh, and um, what was uh, what it did was it designated about five mil up to five million rather of that uh, that money toward food toward a uh, program to provide food and commodities uh, to the community through nonprofit organizations in any case um, Our department uh, received the money in June 2022. Uh, we received about 3.1 million. That's when the funds were loaded. Uh, we then immediately began the process of setting up applications for nonprofit organizations to apply for the grant. Uh, we announced the availability of those funds the following month on July 15th. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we set a deadline for July 25th. Um, we received several applications, and then we wanted to see if we could get some more participants, and we extended it again toward the end of the month in July 2022. Uh, the following month, uh, we were able to get assistance from the Attorney General's office in um, putting together the, uh, the grant agreement um, so we basically we've been working through all that period since August up until November when we finally were able to have a template grant agreement. Um, by last month, we were we had about several agreements drafted, and as of this, as of just uh, within the last couple of days, we've already submitted those agreements to BMR for review signed by our department. Okay. The next presentation, the Division of Public Health, Bureau of Primary Care Services, the Community Health Centers. Slide, please. Thank you. Hello. Half a day, good morning. Um, my name is Dr. Melissa Young. I'm the CEO of the Community Health Center. And um, I will be presenting on the um, current operations, uh, basically going over what we do, who we serve, how we measure our impact, and our continuing efforts to enhance primary care on the island. Okay. And as you see on this slide is um, where the primary care services and the community health centers are in the organizational chart. So we are under the Division of Public Health, and, um, which is led by Deputy Director and Acting uh, Chief Public Health Officer, uh, Laurie Duenas. Next slide, please. 
And as you see here further, the community health centers is under um, also the board of directors, which has an advisory capacity. And at least 51% of the members of the board of directors are patients at the health center and are demographically representative of the populations we serve. Okay. Next slide. So the community health centers, and I'll refer them further in the slides as the CHCs. And we are the only federally qualified health center on Guam with a patient-centered medical home level three recognition. So as an FQHC, we are 100% federally funded, uh, providing comprehensive primary care and enabling services to a medically underserved population regardless of their ability to pay. And I will discuss more on the patient-centered medical home recognition in later slides. Now, in addition, we received a CLIA, or the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment Certificate of Waiver that meets laboratory standards ensuring timeliness, accuracy, and reliability of lab results. Now, as an FQHC, we are also an auto-approved National Health Service Corps uh, site. And um, being an approved um, NHSC site, we can attract and retain qualified and dedicated primary care providers that are eligible for a federal loan repayment program. Next slide, please. Now, RCHCs provide a wide range of primary care services. And so we offer you know, prenatal and um, <clears throat> postpartum care, women's health, we have well baby care, we have child health, adolescent health, and adult care. We also facilitate cancer screening, management of chronic diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, as well as tuberculosis screening and directly observed therapy. We also conduct screening for STDs, as well as immunization and uh, family planning services. Now we operate our lab um, that, uh, again, received CLIA certificate waiver. We have a pharmacy that is the only 340B uh, program um, pharmacy on the island, which allows us to treat low-income and uninsured patients to buy outpatient prescription drugs at a discount of up to 50%. Now, COVID testing and vaccination has become a routine service in our CHCs. And lastly, if a service is not available at the CHC, we establish referral arrangements with community providers such as dental health, mental health, substance use, um, health education, and specialty consult. And in order for us to address you know, the social determinants of health and barriers to access primary care, we provide enabling services such as delivering care to where patients are at, so these are in the form of community outreach. We also develop linkages to obtaining food, you know, shelter, and, and benefits. Um, we facilitate care coordination, language translation and interpretation, and we offer a sliding fee discount program that consists of discounts applied to our fee schedule and adjusted based on the patient's ability to pay. So the sliding fee discount is designed to provide free or discounted care to those who have no means or limited means to pay for their medical services. Next slide. So this is to uh, just show different um, organizations that you know, we proactively communicate and collaborate um, uh, with our programs. So we integrate our activities with uh, similar feder federally funded um, entities, uh, like the different programs within you know, the Division, uh, Department of Public Health and Social Services. We also ensure there's continuity of care across community providers, so that includes hospitals and uh, different private practices. And uh, most importantly, of course, the linkages to human services, such as with, you know, MIP, with SNAP, and WIC. Next slide. Now, uh, we have two sites uh, for our health centers. So one in the northern and one this in the southern. So what you see here is our southern region um, CHC, and this is what it looked about 50 years ago. It used to be known as the Inarahan um, Health Center. And um, it was renamed in 1984 to the Southern Region Community Health Center. So our doors are open from Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. 
And currently, because of um, our limited um, staffing in terms of the physicians and nurses, we currently provide um, pediatric care only, but we're working towards expanding and resuming the services with um, adult care, laboratory, and the full-time pharmacy. Next slide. Okay. Oh, so this is the current um, um, image of our Southern Region Health Center. Next slide, please. And this is our Northern Region Health Center, um, which actually began as a maternal and child clinic um, back in the 1980s and has expanded to primary care in 1998. And here we open from Monday to Saturday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And this is where we provide you know, a, a host of services. We have pediatric care, adult care. We have our laboratory and our pharmacy services in there. And we are providing extended COVID vaccinations uh, from Monday to Thursday uh, until um, we consume our grant in May. But again, the COVID vaccine and testing are already routine uh, part of service of the um, community health center. Next slide, please. Okay. And this is to show you how we are meeting patients where they're at. And so we've started actually virtual care even before COVID, and that's through the telemedicine program with uh, Good Samaritan. And um, back then we were providing dermatology and rheumatology um, consults. And um, through this date, we've continued with the telemedicine program, but it's mostly for primary care. And when it comes to our portable care clinic, so this is where we go to the community, we go to the patient's home, and where we bring some of our primary care services. And we work closely with you know, the, our, our CHC board members as well as the mayor's council so that we can identify areas where transportation may be a barrier and provide these um, uh, primary care services um, where the patients are at. Next slide, please. So these are just additional photos of our outreach. Next, please. And the recent one was um, when we were uh, conducting um, our uh, awareness on COVID vaccination um, in other parts of the community. Next slide. Okay, now when it comes to our patient reach, uh, as you could see on this table, so the years before the pandemic, we have been seeing about 30,000 patient visits or encounters per year. And the significant drop that you see in 2020 was, of course, because of COVID. But please take note that the decrease is consistent among practices everywhere. In some practices, they experience to as much as, to as low as 70% reduction in their patient encounters. For us, we experience about a 40% reduction. Um, but nonetheless, we anticipate that the encounters will recover in the ensuing years. Then also note that these numbers do not include the nurse visits, such as say vaccination. So these are purely um, doctor's visits. And on the third column, um, just gives you a number of how many uh, patients we served in terms of like, um, you know, warm bodies, so unique patients, or we call it the unduplicated patients. Next slide. From our 2021 data, um, we have also noted that majority of um, the patients we see are female. And uh, in terms of the age group, uh, as you see here as well, a majority in, are in the pediatric age group, which is below 18 years old. Next slide. When it comes to a racial or ethnic um, <coughs> composition, <coughs> excuse me, about nine out of 10 patients seen in the CHCs fall under the racial uh, or ethnic minorities. And as you see on the screen, about 54% uh, of the Pacific Islanders were composed of Chamorros, 34% were Chukis, and between one to 4% from other Kofa migrants. When it comes to our Asian population, about 95% of them are Filipinos, and between like one to 4% um, is comprised of Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, and uh, Korean. Next slide. When it comes to payer mix, uh, what you see here on the screen is that 46% of the patients we served are uh, publicly insured, so they have Medicaid and about 26% uh, are uninsured. And 
In comparison to the national data from the National Association of Community Health Center, we are actually seeing more uninsured patients compared to the national average, which is 22% versus what we see uh, in our CHCs, that is uh, 26%. Next slide. And again, our CHC patients are predominantly low income. So 79% of those seen in 2021 were below the federal poverty level. So federal poverty levels are used to determine eligibility for certain programs and benefits like you know, Medicaid and the sliding fee discount program. Now, again, in contrast to national data, we see more low-income patients than Guam. So 79% on Guam versus the national rate at 68%. Next slide. The data you see here is our percentage of appointments for which patients did not show. And this is calculated as the total number of no-show appointments divided by the total number of appointment slots. So this, unfortunately, is a long-standing issue because it um, truly affects resource utilization and post risk to the quality of healthcare services. So despite the appointment call reminders we give out to patients um, at least a day before their, their appointment, and we also issue those appointment cards, um, oftentimes uh, patients will tell us or they would not be able to come to their appointment because of transportation. But again, we see this as an opportunity to improve access to care by adjusting our caseload. So if a patient uh, doesn't show up, we maintain a, uh, a walk-in list so we could still accommodate those walk-ins and we allow double booking so that you know, our provider would still um, make good use of their time while in the clinic. Next slide. This slide is um, you know, an information about our, our patient-centered medical home uh, recognition. And this is coming from the National Committee on Quality Assurance. So if you recall, like for the hospitals, they receive um, you know, a seal of quality from the Joint Commission. So for health insurance, they receive, uh, you know, a, a, a seal of approval from the triple AHC. So for private, pra uh, for, for, for medical practices, like the community health centers, it's through the NCQA or, or the National Committee on Quality Assurance. So this is to show or to demonstrate how we are making, um, you know, an impact in our, in our patients' care. Um, and that's because we've adopted this, um, a uh, patient-centered uh, um, medical home model, which puts patients at the forefront of care so that we're able to build, you know, um, a, a more tighter like relationships between patients and the clinical care teams. So what we do is our staff are heavily involved in quality improvements, improvement programs, and we partner with both, you know, patients and their families in ensuring that, you know, we, we manage their care. And we continue with our team-based approach, um, coordinating care so that we effectively share information with other healthcare providers and manage referrals in a timely manner so that you know, we, reduce, we try to reduce cost and inappropriate care. Uh, an example of what we currently do in our health center um, is related to diabetes. So as we know, diabetes is one of the top 10 um, leading causes of death. And what we found out is that less than 30% of our patients um, are, have received what we call the standards of care for diabetes, meaning um, more more than 70% of them are not getting you know, their annual foot check, their dental exam, their depression screening, or they're not getting their labs checked you know, regularly. And so we wanted to make an impact by ensuring that they would receive those standards of care because again, our aim is to prevent those complications like um, you know, prevent stroke, heart disease, them getting their uh, limbs amputated or dialysis in the future. Okay, next slide. Now this one shows the awards that we receive from HRSA. So HRSA is um, Health Resources and Services Administration. So again, we are 100% um, federally funded and over the years it increased and this reflects uh, both the base and the supplemental grants. And so the peak grant was around 2020 and that was because of you know, COVID related uh, funding that we received from uh, the federal government. Next slide. 
we also look at the total cost per patient at our CHCs. And we've seen, again, over the years that the cost is increasing. And the way this is calculated is the, the overhead expense divided by the number of patients seen in our, in our CHCs. And um, we, factored, we factor in you know, inflation, the increasing cost of supplies, and you know, demand for like, competitive salaries that had probably increased you know, this cost of care. And this is one of the um, one of the items that we are uh, looking at on how we could reduce that, that cost of care and still continue providing a comprehensive primary care um, uh, that's high quality. Next slide. This is to show our program income over the years, and this is our gross program income. And you would see that there's a spike around 2016, and that was when we had improved our billing practices. So um, we were cited actually by HRSA, you know, during their, their visit that um, some of our bills have not been, you know, turned into the, uh, to the payers. And so the way we address this is that um, we hired and retained um, billing staff and uh, eligibility specialists uh, to ensure that, you know, we, we collect and we submit those um, uh, claims uh, to the respective payers. Next slide. This is a snapshot of our accounts receivable, and the data we have is, um, this is the most recent as of September uh, of 2022. And if you look on the first column at the bottom, so we expect to still collect around um, $595,000 um, from these various payers. Okay. And what I also wanted to point out here is that um, we are current in our billing uh, submission. So it's like with some of these that are claims that are 120 plus days, you could see it's still a small amount. And um, as of the September 30 data, we are still within that 90-day um, uh, you know, filing of the claim. Okay, next slide. Now, um, we, are, we all acknowledge that, of course, COVID has taken a toll in, in each of our lives, and most especially to our um, dedicated and hardworking staff at the CHCs. And, you know, they have kept our operations afloat um, with, of course, guidance from the director, from the board of directors, um, and, of course, from, uh, from, from our deputy directors. So at this time, we are looking into, you know, the next chapter of our, uh, the history of the community health center. And so we are uh, looking into sustaining our recognition with a patient-centered medical home, as well as our recertification of our CLIA waiver for our lab. And the biggest one is really the site visit with HRSA. So the last um, site visits we've had was um, back in 2019 for HRSA, and it was in 2018 um, with the patient-centered medical home. Now, um, we were also able to receive funding through the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, and we are hoping to expand some of our patient care areas in the Northern Region Health Center and um, improvements such as roof painting and water blasting of both the North and the Southern uh, Health Center. Okay. Uh, we are looking into um, improving our health technology, health information technology, and we are uh, planning this year to purchase a new electronic health record as well as updating our um, pharmacy operating system. And so that will allow us, of course, to you know, submit claims electronically and be able to um, efficiently, say, send records or referrals from you know, another healthcare organization or another medical practice so that, again, it's a seamless you know, coordination of care. And uh, we are hoping that it would allow us to interface with local registries, meaning we only enter it once in the EHR, and then it gets transmitted to local registry, like with the immunizations, um, web IZ, and also a direct access to uh, DLS portal, which is uh, to view laboratory results. And um, we are also looking at continuing, of course, our monthly extended COVID vaccination outreach clinics and reevaluating our operational costs, which I mentioned earlier, um, and look at the, the sustainability of the services we offered. And um, we're hoping that, you know, we could streamline a lot of our processes, like eliminating manual and making it, you know, more electronic. And lastly, because we are, um, you know, a, a healthcare organization, we are a medical practice that we are subjected to 
um, you know, these barriers, like these challenges operating in, say, a complex, like, situations. So we would want to be able to timely recruit, you know, providers and staffing and uh, offer competitive salary and respond to emergencies, you know, um, especially with the evolving, um, you know, healthcare landscape. And so that's why we are looking at exploring a semi-autonomous status for the community health center. That's it. That's it. Thank you. The next presentation is by the Division of Public Health, Bureau of Family Health and Nursing Services. Good morning, Senators, um, and for the Committee of Health. My name is Margarita Bautista Gay. I am the administrator for the Bureau of Family Health and Nursing Services. And today I have Maggie Bell, who is also a Maternal Child Health Program Coordinator. So, um, as you heard, the CHC, oh, am I still, oh, sorry. Um, we, our mission for the Bureau of Family Health and Nursing Services is to provide the community health nursing services by synthesizing nursing practice and public health practices, which focus on health promotion, disease prevention, early detection, and treatment of health problems, and restoration of health of the individuals, families, and communities. Um, the difference, um, you wanted to, um, Senator, you wanted to know, we were previous, previously located at the Central Public Health Center in Mingilao, and we are relocated now to Northern Community Health Center. Um, the difference when you hear Bureau of Family Health and our mission, we're out there in the community. Um, we're the, the, the nurses that do the home visiting, um, do the, give out the shot uh, immunization throughout. So um, that's a picture of how we are in, in the community. So next slide. So here is our organizational chart. We still maintain all those programs and divisions, even though we were displaced <laughs> uh, with a little bit of shortage of um, personnel. But uh, as I go on the left side, the Maternal and Child Health Program, that is our grant program that provides a lot of funding to, to the services that we give to the community which has a program coordinator for, which is Maggie Bell. In that uh, program, we also look, we have um, children, with children and youth with special health needs. And um, that is a program that focuses on funding uh, these children uh, with um, services. With that, also, we have the State Systems Development Initiative Grant, which entails of data, uh, communicating with the other programs on our data system, which we have a data clerk. The newest one uh, grant that we received uh, is Maternal Mortality um, Review Committee. And this grant was um, related to our increase in maternal mortality and infant rate on Guam. And so uh, we have that under the MCH program. Next, the next program that I oversee is the Project Visita y Familia. It's the Maternal Infant Early Childhood Home Visiting uh, Program, which entails a program uh, coordinator, a nursing supervisor, and two community health nurses, two and one community health nurse, and a community program aide. These nurses and program aide, they provide the home visiting services throughout the different villages uh, that we have found to have the greatest need. Our next program, or our next uh, section, which is one that you mentioned, Senator, uh, our central uh, public health clinic. Like I said, we were located in Mingilao. We were, because um, of the maternal child health program, they bring in the the clients that are in need, which is with no insurance or uh, underinsured. And so this clinic uh, consisted before uh, STD clinic, 
uh, the maternal child health clinic. But for, for us right now, um, I oversee the MCH Women's Health Clinic and Child Health Clinic, and which entails a nurse supervisor, two nurse, su nurse uh, community health nurse two, and three uh, certified nurse aides. In this clinic, they provide the, I will go through the, in the next slide, uh, exactly their services. And, and we are also assisting the tuberculosis clinic at the same time. Okay. Then the next, uh, with, with the medical clinic, we always need to have our medical records. And I, um, I have one medical uh, records clerk with us with all the medical records in Northern uh, CHC. With the medical records, we, um, we need our, 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 our kind of our glue to our programs and clinics is our medical social work, uh, social service section. And this entitles two medical social worker twos and one medical social or three. Um, and they are the, you know, they assist the patient to navigate themselves throughout the programs. Uh, and then finally, we have the family health and information resource center uh, program, which is a center where parents would go to get re to understand what 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 is out there, what resources are there for both uh, early childhood education and health. Okay, next slide. And so, like I was um, uh, speaking about the clinic services. That MCH clinic that we, um, we have uh, at the Northern Health Center provides individuals who are underserved and, and those without health insurance. And these are the following clinics. They provide women's health clinics. We provide prenatal postpartum nursing care services to low-income families, family planning counseling, cancer screening, and health uh, education. So as you can see, we, we did have, uh, we're still in a surge of um, um, a lot of pregnant women out there. And we're also going through a decrease in OBGYN providers. So we are seeing the increase in our clinic. Uh, child health clinic, we provide well baby checkups, school physicals, childhood immunization, and we, um, that is provided by a, medical, a pediatrician. Our adolescent health clinic, we provide the adolescents with family planning counsel, prevention, education, and uh, physical examination. We also, uh, one um, in, like highlight of our clinic is we provide early prenatal care classes. And it's open to anybody that is our clients or even if they wanna outside, is we provide this education for pregnant women on the importance of prenatal care, proper breastfeeding techniques, education, nutrition, and other issues related to pregnancy. So it's a, a class where the nurses teach the clients on the, the, the different uh, stages of pregnancy, and it's a value for everyone, okay? And then um, what we provide walk-in immunization clinics, again, at the Northern, uh, we provide immunizations to serve the children zero to 18 without health insurance or with Medicaid or with MIP. We assist the WIC immunization outreaches and we are, we are involved in other island-wide village immunization clinics. So as of right now, we have one going on at Daddy Doe Flea Market. Uh, our intent was to go out to the community monthly to provide at mayor's office, uh, this important uh, service. Um, and so, as you can see, we not only, we're not only in the clinic, we're out, outside. So during a uh, pandemic, we were the first to be deployed. <laughs> uh, we introduced Guam healthcare workers and nurses on what might happen, and in less than a week or two, uh, COVID uh, arrived. 
So we were the front, the first responders. We were the ones to try everything, try how to uh, test people, how to vaccinate, how to visit them when they were sick. And uh, we provided, we assisted in all, uh, and I think it was all of, all of public health, but, but the nurses were out there testing and uh, providing isolation, home visits. And so um, that's another picture of us. Okay, so nursing service, next slide, nursing services with the home visiting program. And like I said, Project Basita y Familia is a, a collaborative project designed to plan, implement, sustain an effective evidence-based home visiting program for at-risk children, birth to five years old, and their families and the community of Guam. And so this home visiting program which you can see in the org chart has nurses and it has been proven and I've been with other states with other programs that nurses make a difference in home visiting. And so these nurses not only are health counselors to our clients, but they provide positive parent-child bonding um, relationship education to their families within the program. So by educating the families on child health, so the parents are aware what are the milestones of the children, and so what do they need to work on? So instead of finding out at the doctor's office, oh, my child hasn't um, drank from the cup yet or something. So they're uh, able to work with the families on that. They also educate on child safety, especially with uh, child uh, car seat, uh, um, car seat safety, um, you know, regular preventive injury. And within our um, caseload, uh, majority have not, the kids have not uh, been in the hospital for any urgent emergency. So they educate these parents to be aware of the safety of their children. They also educate on protective factors, which are social connections, um, concrete support in their, uh, of their needs and social and emotional competent of their children. So we, the main thing is to educate the parents to help take care of their children and to increase their bonding. So the more bonding, the better relationship, the better growth they will go through. And, and because majority are nurses, um, we, um, educate on healthy child health practices. So of course, uh, dental care, um, immunization, because you know, needs are not the same as us. Uh, the family has different needs, so we need to help them prioritize what is good for the child and their, their families. Next slide. Um, we also provide other health services, like I mentioned, the medical social service section which is uh, managed by social workers. Um, they provide valuable service in the community through social work interventions by promoting, enhancing the problem solving and coping cap cap capacities of, of patients. So we don't hold their hand uh, like, uh, let's fill the application together. No, we make them understand what is needed, how, it's, how to get it, and how to um, um, submit it and, and, and take the responsibility on what they do. So they assist patients to navigate through the other public health services like, uh, like mentioned earlier, Medicaid, SNAP, WIC, um, and cancer screen. So different, so they're the ones to refer the clients after seen by our providers. Um, we offer and educate families of children and youth with special health care needs, clinics, programs, awareness, and awareness of resource available. So uh, we, uh, we, we hold two clinics in the, well, it was in Central, but we have branched out. <laughs> so uh, one is the Honolulu Shriners uh, Outreach Clinic which they used to come twice a year. Now they come three times a year. And they provide clinical service uh, for orthopedic um, issues with children. 
And so now we have partnered with Guam Regional Medical Center, GRMC, and they now come three times a week. And not only do they do see them in the clinic, they do minor surgeries with the children. So instead of going to Honolulu to do a minor, um, you know, like, uh, minor uh, surgery, they're able to do it here with the, with the Shriners group. The other um, special needs uh, clinics we have is the Hemophilia Von Wildebrand's Bleeding Disorder Clinics, which we offer um, monthly at the Northern uh, Health Center. So these are just a few that we uh, oversee. And then, next slide. So here is our data. Um, we started in, well, we start, the data starts at 2016. We were very good in, in our women's health, child health immunization. We immunized 3,000 children. Um, the CETA just starting, children health care needs was also building up. And as we go on in 2018, we had issues with staffing uh, we lost we uh, lost some nurses. We gained them, but we lost some providers. Um, the previous we had two nurse practitioners, but in this year we we had only one to see women's health and child health. So our numbers went a li slightly down. Um, and then 2019, as you know, um, we we started with the dengue response, and or our 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 um, our our dengue, then we had our electrical fire at, at Mingilao, so we were relocated, and then COVID came. So 2019, 2020 was not our favorite. Uh, a lot of things went down, but during, even though we were relocated right after the electrical fire, our nurse practitioner continued the women's health and child health too whatever the COVID precautions, because before you can't just walk in the clinic, you had to make an appointment and you had to wait outside and, and then only certain people can come in. So we didn't stop, but we had to hold the immunization. As you can see, the data says zero of that because we weren't able to do it because of the social distancing. But as the 2021 21 came up, we started slightly opening up and so we increased and due to um, also I like I said earlier the pregnancy rate went up so we were able to see a hundred thousand four hundred twenty two uh, women uh, 124 children immunized 586 and uh, Besita was able to see 262 families and our children with special health needs continued at 777 and so um, the immunization just just this year opened up, so we are able to give vaccination at this northern uh, CHC uh, four times a week, and then we do village outreach, and we we partner with the other uh, programs to uh, bring our our programs out to the community. And thank thank you, and uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, speaker, the next presentation will be by the Division of Environmental Health regarding health certificates. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, half day, good morning. My name is Tom Nado. I am the Chief Environmental Public Health Officer with the Division of Environmental Health. And with me is Ms. Esther Figure. She's a Customer Service Supervisor. Uh, as you know in your handout, there we have 10 slides, so if you're expecting less, I do apologize but I have tendency of speaking quickly, so hopefully this will go by faster than maybe what you're anticipating. So, um, so one of the many environmental health services that we provide at the Division of Environmental Health is the issuance of health certificates to employees of health regulated establishments. The agenda for this part of the discussion reads, operational issues where processing health certificates. Thus, we presume some complaints and issues have been raised to this body about the health certificates that's issued by our office. Uh, and I suspect these issues are some of the same issues that's brought to our attention, that has been brought to our attention as well. Therefore, while presenting our slides on health certificate issuance, I will be sharing and discussing the various concerns 
and complaints that we're aware of regarding health certificates with the hopes that I will be able to adequately explain or justify uh, operations while acknowledging that we do have challenges and potential solutions for them. So with that, I'll begin. Thank you. So what is a health certificate? Health certificate is a document issued by our Division of Environmental Health, otherwise known as DEH, pursuant to the requirements of Title 10 GCA, Chapter 22, and its accompanying rules and regulations. A health certificate attests that its holder is free of TB disease and other applicable diseases at the time of his or her application. And the holder possesses the minimum knowledge in preventing foodborne illness if employed at a food establishment. All health certificates expire one year from date of application, except temporary health certificates. These temporary health certificates that we issue are for those employed briefly in a temporary food service establishment for a temporary event where food is sold. The requirements for a temporary health certificate are less than that of a regular health certificate, but, the greater, but with greater restrictions, which I will share in later slides. Next slide, please. So who needs a health certificate? Uh, an individual will require a health certificate if he or she will be working at a food facility, such as a restaurant, food manufacturer, and a retail store where food is sold. In, majority, in fact, majority of those who possess a health certificate, which is approximately 95%, are employed at a food facility. But it's also required for those working at institutional facilities, cosmetic establishments, massage establishments, laundromats, public pools, hotels, and tattoo shops. However, at this time, health certificates are not being required for employees for certain health regulated establishments due to the absence of specific standards for that category. But we are working to address this by revising existing regulations or adopting new regulations. Next slide, please. So I discussed with you who needs it. Now, who doesn't need a health certificate? A person exempt from possessing a health certificate if he or she sells fresh, unprocessed agricultural products such as fresh fruits and vegetables, those selling canned or bottled drinks in its original container, candies and other confectionaries in original packaging, other consumer commodities not explicitly mentioned, such as cosmetics and medical devices. Next slide, please. So what are the requirements to obtain a health certificate? To obtain a health certificate, individual will need to submit an application and pay the $10 processing fee. He or she must be authorized to work in the United States, thus Guam show proof of negative TB skin tests, and if positive, must obtain a clearance from the department's TB program. The TB program is managed by our colleagues at Division of Public Health. That particular office and our DH office used to be located in Manila Public Health Facility. Uh, currently, our office is located in Ganya, while the TB program is operating from the Northern Community Health Center. Thus, applicants who are positive reactor will need to go to Northern Community Health Center in Derido and then return to our office in Aganya after receiving their clearance. And that is one of the complaints that we have received in the past. Uh, and to prepare the applicant for the possibility that he or she may need clearance from the TB program, if positive, uh, it is noted in the health of the application form. However, we do acknowledge that it does not disclose the location of the TB program at this time in Derido, which unfortunately has led to frustration with a few number of individuals as they were not expecting to travel to and from Derido. Uh, so to address that, we'll be updating our application forms and instructions so to inform and thus prepare our clients for that. In addition, we'll be reaching out to the program, TB program uh, with the Division of Public Health to further discuss this matter with the goal of minimizing the inconvenience of traveling between the two locations for clearance. Uh, by the way, the TB test is only required for first-time applicants if working at a food facility. However, for applicants employed at a child care facility and other institutional facilities, the individuals must take, pass a physical examination and the TB test annually. In addition to a TB test, for those employed at a food facility, the applicant must pass a basic food safety course this course provides a minimum food safety education necessary to prevent the employee from contributing to a foodborne illness outbreak. For this, first-time applicant is scheduled for a food safety training course and issue what is called an interim health certificate, which is a type of health certificate that allows the applicant to work while waiting to take the food safety course that is generally scheduled within a week of applying. This interim health certificate 
health certificate expires three business days after the date of training, so to allow the individual to make arrangements to reschedule the course uh, in the event he or she fails for whatever reason, or fails to attend for whatever reasons. However, upon passing the course, the individual will be given a regular health certificate, which is valid for one year. Uh, the fee for the training course is $15. If the applicant fails the food safety course, the interim health certificate will be extended until the next course date, and the individual must once again pay the required training course fee. If the person fails a second time, the applicant has option to continue taking the course until he or she passes, or seek a conditional health certificate where the applicant and his or her manager at place of employment who must possess a certificate of management certification agrees to enter a written contract with us which stipulates that the manager will provide on-the-job training on food safety and supervised employee. For an applicant seeking to renew his or her health certificate for a food facility, the applicant must attend and pass a refresher training course on food safety. The study manual and the test are all available in English and four other languages. The percentage of applicants passing the basic food safety course is about 90%, while 99% of those who take the refresher course pass the course. One of the complaints we've received about the health certificate training course has been why a renewing applicant needs to take the course, the refresher course. Uh, we respond by explaining that the regulation authorizes us to implement such a renewal course, and we have, which we have opted to do so. As food handlers contribute to the majority of foodborne illness outbreaks reported in the United States, if not the world. Everything from poor hygiene to improperly cooked food are a result of negligence by food handlers. Thus, these refresher courses remind and reinforce proper food handling techniques and apprises them of new requirements in food safety. In addition, a health certificate is portable within each category, meaning that it can be taken and used for any establishment within the same category, including food facilities. By requiring the food, safe, by requiring the food handler to get training every year, it ensures that the person is always trained in all aspects of food safety, regardless of his or her job title and responsibility, which may differ between jobs in that industry. So one day, may, for one location, he or she may be a stalker or someone who shelves uh, food commodity uh, at the place of employment, or actually the food handler uh, prepping, cooking, uh, storing, holding the food that's provided to those who, uh, uh, who attend, uh, who goes to a restaurant. Next slide, please. So what are the requirements for a temporary health certificate? To obtain a temporary health certificate, the operator of the temporary food establishment must submit a list of temporary employees and pay the appropriate fee, which is currently $15 per employee. These temporary employees are given short briefing about food safety requirements prior to the start of the temporary event. The operator or manager of temporary food service establishment signs a contract known as the, quote, temporary health certificate contract. By signing this contract, the manager agrees to supervise a temporary employee to ensure proper food safety, food safe, proper safe food handling and prevents them from working if they exhibit symptoms of foodborne illness. Individuals with temporary health certificate cannot work if servicing primarily high-risk populations such as the young, old, and the sick. And the temporary health certificate is valid only for the duration of that temporary event. Next slide, please. So uh, an individual seeking to renew the health certificate for food facility may elect to skip the training course and simply take the exam to test out. We do provide that service and opportunity. All food facilities that provide food directly, I emphasize that directly to consumers, must have a manager on duty who possesses an advanced certification food safety known as Certificate of Management Certification, which, offers, which is offered by Guam Community College, but may be substituted for other certifications recognized by the division. Manager certification is not required for food manufacturers, processors, and distributors as they do not provide food directly to consumers. On few occasions, we've had operators of small retail stores or businesses that sell prepackaged food complain about the need to have a certified manager on duty. Now, DEH has required certificate of management certification as there are studies 
which found that food establishments with certified managers are less likely to be involved in foodborne disease outbreaks when compared to those establishments without such manager. We've taken this information and applied it to all retail food facilities, regardless of their size, type, and food service sold or provided. All it takes is a single outbreak to sicken tens, if not hundreds, of individuals. In respect to operational issues that are internal in nature related to health certificate, uh, we do have, we are, we have not adopted regulations to some institutional facilities, thus no standards exist for the issuance of health certificate for employees of those establishments. However, we are addressing this uh, as we are continuing developing new regulations. We are currently updating our hotel regulation to specifically identify those who will need a health certificate and the training necessary. As a result, at this time, we're not requiring a health certificate from those who are employees working at hotels and motels, but they do need a sanitary permit. Although we are issuing health certificates for employees at laundromats, childcare facilities, cosmetic and massage establishments, tattoo shops, we have yet to develop actual training courses for them, but this fiscal year we hope to implement a training course for employees of cosmetic establishments. Next slide, please. On the screen, there are three tables showing the number of health certificates issued and the revenues generated from 2020 to 2022 and the projected, uh, and the projected numbers for this fiscal year. As noted in the top table, we averaged the issuance of about just over 20,000 health certificates and generated close to 468,000 uh, in the year in the past fiscal year, in the past three fiscal years. The middle table breaks down the issuances for the three fiscal years by new and renewal health certificate. Uh, please note that these numbers do not include the issuance of duplicate copies and amendments, thus will not equal to the numbers noted in the top table. The bottom table simply provides the numbers projected for this fiscal year in 2023. And on the topic of revenue, thus money, the most common complaints we get from the public about our health certificate operation is that we do not accept credit cards or debit cards for payment. Uh, it is our desire to do so. However, we've been informed by the Treasurer of Guam that the credit card machines are not being provided at this time. And we last spoke to them two days ago, and that, and that, and that information has been uh, the same. Next slide, please. Uh, the two tables on this slide present data for the interim and refresher health certificate training course. And if you recall, the interim health certificate are those applicants applying for the first time, <clears throat> excuse me, while the refresher courses are for renewing applicants. As the top table shows, we provide an average of about 754 training courses a year in the last fiscal year, last three fiscal years. The bottom table shows the projected number for FY23. Next slide, please. On the average, an applicant may wait about 10 minutes in line, another 10 minutes to be processed to receive a health certificate. These times are based on just personal observations by the staff and not any formal study that we've conducted. So that the numbers, the true numbers may actually be less. And in fact, uh, many occasions, which uh, Esther will test, it's done in a matter of minutes. Except for those rare moments when we lose electrical power at our office or our information system sits, shuts down, Waiting and processing times at our office have not been an issue of concern. Next slide, please. All intake, processing, and issuance of health certificate occurs in the division's processing center by our customer service representatives. After receiving their service, every client is given a client satisfaction survey with the request that they complete the form and drop it in our survey box. The survey is anonymous. We do not ask for the name of the client. The survey form asks the client to rate the qualities of our timeliness, friendliness, and helpfulness in their overall experience with our staff. In FY 2022, we had received 2,577 survey response, responses, which is about 10% of our clients, and the results of the survey are presented in the table on the screen. And I'm very pleased and proud to say that the staff of the Process Center section, they rated very well in every category, 90 or nearly 90% of those who took their survey rated their service as excellent. Uh, in fact, uh, this reflects the great work of Esther and her staff. And I'd like to actually public uh, acknowledge them, if it's okay. Um, they are Jennifer Mendiola, Marie Cepeda, Debbie Mofnes, Mary Castro, and Michiko Lujan. Uh, in fact, I wish to provide to you all a summary report of the customer service team. If you can, to us. Please, thank you. Of our customer satisfaction survey, which includes all written comments 
of the responder. Uh, if and when you have the opportunity to read this, you'll note that majority of the comments are glowing and speak very well of Ms. Figure and her staff and the services they provide. Now, there are of course rare comments that we do receive about their less than positive experience, uh, but I will say that every one of those comments are reviewed by management at DEH with the goal of correcting or improving our operations. But most of these comments uh, have been things that are beyond our control. For example, parking and the non-acceptance of credit cards. Uh, this concludes my presentation. We thank you for providing the oppor opportunity to share our health certificate operations. Thank you very much. Jesus Masi. Thank you. The next and final presentation is by the Division of General Administration, Employee Pandemic Overtime. Before we begin, I'd like to just acknowledge, so uh, Mr. Nadeau, you passed this out to us. This is a packet. It says Client Satisfaction Survey on the top and other forms, I guess. That's correct. That actually all right. lists all the comments we received in FY22. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, the comments that yes, you've received. comments oh. as well as the, uh, the data that was presented on I the screen. I see. All right. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Speaker. My apologies. Okay. Please proceed. So the next and final presentation is by the Division of General Administration, Employee Pandemic Overtime. So half a day, half a day, Senators. My name is Joaquin Blas, and with me is Margaret Aguto. We are from the Division of General Administration. Um, <clears throat> we are the, um, the last review process for overtime before um, it gets to the director uh, for his signature and it goes out to DOA for payment. The director asked us to speak a little bit <laughs> on where we are with uh, the overtime, <clears throat> the pandemic overtime um, for DPHSS. Can we get the slide, please? So as of um, April, uh, I'm sorry, uh, January 14th, we have paid to date approximately $1.8 million in overtime, and we have utilized the, the ARP funding that was given to us by, the, um, by, the, um, by BBMR. And as of that day, um, those funds have been exhausted for overtime, okay? And the director had asked us, what is unpaid? So we have approximately $421,000 in unpaid overtime, and we broke it down by fiscal year. And, and it may be a little bit misleading. It, it does not mean that we've um, had these documents since, for example, 8 15, 2020. Okay? It, it was just broken down to show you by year what's owed. And I'll give you an example. We, when we made the final call to ask all the bureaus and divisions to submit overtime, we received one bureau that um, submitted um, uh, their overtime pay for six pay periods from last year. So, you know, we're, we're getting them piecemeal, okay? And um, as soon as we get them, it's, it is a lengthy process on our part to, to review and audit them because we have to go through each individual um, timesheet to ensure that it's accurate before um, Margaret certifies for funding, okay? Um, we have identified uh, local funds within our budget, you know, and we went and we scrubbed the accounts and we, we, realized, you know, we said, okay, we can, we are able to accommodate this. We are working with BBMR to figure out how we're going to, when we finally do move the funds out of the, the various accounts that we have, whether we should put it into one account or whether we should allocate it out through the six divisions, right? It might be easier to like with the ARP funding, it was just one account, and we can just pay it out of that, and we can track it better that way, okay? Um, so we estimate that once we start um, moving the funds out, that within the next two to three weeks, um, the remaining 421000 should be paid out to the employees. Now, we do have, um, I, I believe, a, a one or two um, sections that are trickling in after the January 14th date, and that's only a, a couple, $3,000, okay? And, and so we will add that to the total, but um, we believe this is the last of it since the PHE ended on January 6th. And with that, that is the update on the overtime pay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that actually concludes the presentation as requested. Uh, for the Department of Public Health and Social Services. I'd like to thank the senators, of course, through sitting through this process, as well as our viewers, and of course, the employees here today that have presented on their, their bureaus and their programs. We're now open for questions. Thank you. Thank you so very much for all of you, for your presentations, and senators, for your patience in holding your questions until the end. I'd like to actually just begin at the end. We'll start, and uh, we'll do questions by round with uh, 
heard the topics that they presented. So I'm going to begin with the overtime. If any of the senators have questions on the overtime, I'm going to go in the order of how you showed up. So Senator Duane, I mean, Senator Kanata, if you have any questions. Sorry, I'm so, I, I didn't get your name, sir. Um, Kin. Mr. Kin. Kin Bloss. Mr. Kin Bloss. I just wanted to clarify, the 421,106, can that be absorbed or picked up by the ARP funds or federal funds that were allotted to the government of Guam? The ARP funding that was given to us, we've, we've exhausted those funds. And okay. at the, actually, the account is closed. Okay. And we did look into trying to see whether some of the other uh, divisions, federal funds can absorb, and, and th those amounts were already taken out, you know. Okay. They were uh, uh, attributable to their programs, and this is just the remaining that was strictly COVID that, uh, that, wasn't, that is not being able to be paid up by their federal funds. Okay, and, yeah. and just to clarify, these, these, um, this 42106 is uh, outstanding as of when? I, um, well, some, like I said, some timesheets go as far back as 8 15 2020, okay? And that is because um, um, some bureaus just may not have submitted it in a timely manner. Okay. So by the time um, when we made the call out um, last month for, for everyone to submit, this mm -hmm. is when we finally got the last package. So we, this is um, the 420,000 reflects that. And so it goes as far back a couple of times, she says 8 15 2020, right? And, um, that's where we're at. So, and we do, we, we, we may have one after the PHE ended on January 6th, but we're trying to work that out because, you know, we're, um, since the PHE ended on January 6th, right, we're not sure whether we're, we're able to cover that. And just to clarify, 2020? Yes. Okay. But that's not, doesn't mean it, 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 it was just like... Uh, certain uh, individuals. Certain individuals who, whose timekeeper may have failed to because uh, um, you know people um, left the department during the uh, pandemic, okay. so you know these they were playing catch up, right? And they okay. they finally realized that these individuals may not have gotten paid. So now we're addressing that when we made the final call. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank. You. Thank you, Senator. I want to acknowledge that this is one of the complaints that we have received in our office. Uh, this goes back actually farther than the complaint I received was from April, mm -hmm. April 2022. Mm -hmm. But this goes back to 2020. So. I feel for these employees, so I'm, uh, I hope it's correct. You said you will be paying within two to three weeks. You're processing them all right now. Are you, is there something that will prevent these uh, supervisors from submitting these things late? I, that's, a, that's a question for the division, so yes. I'm not certain why. We're just the last um, <coughs> stop right, mm -hmm. before, before the director signs off and Margaret certifies the funds. Um, we don't have control over that, you know, we yeah. get it. So yeah. are you uh, testifying that you'd pay them on time if you received them? In general, yes. When, when we had the, the money in the ARP account, right, um, they were being paid in a timely manner, okay. is what I was told. But once we ran out of the funding, right, when we exhausted the 1.8, that's when there was a lag because we, we ran out, I believe, in November or de December of last year. And so, you know, when we made the final call, when we were trying to identify where we're going to get the rest okay. of the funds, right, that's when we found that a lot of them were trickling in slowly. All right. We know that there's still ARP funds in the government, but just not in I, public health. Yes. Okay, thank that you. That is correct. Senator but we Fish did, we oh. are speaker. Um, uh, we did make the effort to look whether the other programs uh, or other divisions, federal programs, can try to absorb this so we can pay it off faster. All right, so thank those you. Those we, we pulled aside and they have been paid out, I believe. Okay, thank you. Senator Fisher. Senator Fisher, on overtime? Pardon? Do you have any questions on the overtime issue? Yes, I Senator? do. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm looking at the uh, sir. I'm looking at um, your chart, and I see that uh, the overtime increased from 72,000 to 320,000 uh, during a fiscal year. And then, just previously, you said people left the department during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Did people leaving your department during the pandemic result in the increase in overtime? Okay, so the because the overtime payments were made, and, and this is just the last batch. So we broke it down by fiscal year. So we're saying that 
um, in FY21, there's still $28,000 remaining, right? And the bulk of it is, the, is just the, this last fiscal year, mm -hmm. right? And when I mentioned that people, um, that people had left during the pandemic, it was, what I mean is that um, a lot of the times, um, these timesheets may have not gotten to the division of administration is because timekeepers or individuals who are in charge of doing this may have left public health and so it, it probably was, it fell through the cracks and, and uh, so when we made the final call to get everything else in, I guess uh, the bureaus got together and made sure. So this number, at least for fiscal year 2000, I guess 22 of 320,000, that reflects an amalgamation of all of the overtime? Because it reflects Yes, it reflects but the pandemic overtime for FY22, the remaining for FY22. These are just the unpaid amounts. The unpaid right, amounts, right, yes. yeah, yes. yeah. Okay, but I'm just wondering about the spike, how did that, how that occurred? Actually, I, 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 we didn't break down from the, what, the 1.8, because we weren't asked to do that, right? We were only asked what was remaining, and okay. what was remaining is the 421,000, and, and we just broke down the 421,000 into fiscal years, and the bulk of the, the 421,000 is from FY22. Okay. Okay. And, and the reason why you see the, the amounts in, in the previous year is because of those, it was those timesheets that just didn't make it into uh, our, our section on time to get paid in a timely manner. All right, Senator Taitigui, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you everyone for being here today and providing your testimonies for oral, your, your oral presentation. Um, there is, when you talk about breakdown and you talk about these overtimes, um, what can, uh, when the employee receives their check, you know, they know they get paid from eight to five, you know, it's part of their check. But when they receive these overtimes, is there a breakdown that's given to the employees to show them where they, they met this overtime? To each individual employee, where are they given this information? I'm not. I'm not certain. Um, um, but we maybe can... the director, Terry. You know, to the best of my knowledge, when an employee works, they actually complete their overtime form. So even as they're filling it out, the employee would know exactly what it, hours they're putting in. But I think your question has more to do with because there are multiple overtime requests or documents that can be completed, right? Because, because every, every two weeks are being paid, right? right? So you're trying to say specifically when they do fill it in, which specific time period is being paid Are you paid being that paid overtime? for, which that is your regular salary and which is your overtime salary? There should be a breakdown to all the employees on their, on, when they receive their checks or they get that second stub that's attached right. to show you the time frame in which they receive their overtime and how much they're getting paid for that. Right. That should be given to every employee. Is this happening right now yeah. or? You know, to the best of my knowledge, it, it's not. However. Why not? Uh, well, I'm not, I'm to the best of my knowledge. So okay. that doesn't mean it isn't, it's just okay. to the best of my knowledge. So what we can do is reach out to the timekeeper uh, because they would actually have the forms that were completed and they can track that. So if that's your request, we will definitely get back to the timekeeper and we will, we will work through that process. Okay, Terry, I want a discussion. little bit more than that. I'd like to know when these individual employees receive their overtime, if any of them did not receive a breakdown of their overtime versus their regular salary, you know, throughout the day, we, we got to know that. How long has this been going on? Um, overtime is starting to be paid out since uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. Is that when you started the overtime payout, payouts? That's correct. Okay. So from 2020 until today, uh, we, every employee should have a breakdown of their overtime. That is separate and apart from the regular hours. Yes. Okay. And mm -hmm. if no employee has that, we, we've got to know. So I want to know where, where it fell through. If, mm -hmm. if it did happen, like you said, Terry, and, right. and we need to look into it. And um, if there's any complaints from any of these employees, you know, if public health is hearing right now, and if you have an issue with that, then, you know, please see Terry. And if not, they're not helping you out, then my door is always open. So that's well, all I have. Thank you. We appreciate that. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Senator Barnett. Good morning, public health. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, just on the subject of the overtime, the only question I had was, uh, you said that you're working with BBMR to move the funds, but do you know where the funds are being moved from? 
No, the funds are, are internal public health funds. Okay. But we're, we're just trying to figure out whether we should allocate those funds over the six divisions or we should uh, make it out of just one particular account, like the ARP fund. Yeah, the, 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 the bulk of the 1.8 was paid for. So it's probably easier in, our, in my mind, right, that we should do, track it out of just one account versus six different accounts. Are there any uh, efforts underway to uh, improve the efficiency of the payment of overtime so that we don't end up in a situation where employees are waiting uh, two to three years to receive what they're owed? Yeah. Well, there is, you know, we did make the final call for it. So, um, and this is what the, the 421 is the final amount that we, we estimate to be for the pandemic since the PHE has ended. So um, regular overtime, I believe, is being addressed in a timely manner. Current, so you're current on... on on regular, on regular overtime. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Parkinson. No questions, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much. Senator Brown, our Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wouldn't pass the opportunity to talk to the infamous Kin Blas. <laughs> so if Senator Kanata does not know the infamous Kin Blas, I'm sure after this morning uh, he will. It's always good to see you, Kin, and thank you nice for you, uh, providing your information with regards to the overtime. I mean, I'm sure that with the, the amount of work and challenges public health had to deal with during the pandemic, I mean, understandable. There, there was a lot of, lot of moving parts, and so I mean, I think we recognize the need to pay the overtime and certainly we're concerned about the delay. Uh, but I did want to ask, and maybe I can address the question to, to the deputy director. Um, have you put, do you have your processes in place with regards to just overtime? I mean, I understand during this time there was a lot of work for public health. But normally, you know, your supervisors or your admin all the way up to the director would authorize overtime before it's undertaken so that you at your level would be aware of what overtime's being, um, you know, used by your employees so that you don't have a situation where, you know, you're calling out two or three years later to ask, is there any additional payments we owe? Mm -hmm. Normally management should authorize that so that they know what needs to be paid so that you can make sure and your certifying officers make sure that the funds are available to pay it before you, you know, have your staff do the work. Yeah. Yes, Senator, I actually totally agree. And, you know, each case, although has commonality, there have been some unique cases people that actually are claiming overtime for previous years, uh, just recently submitting them. So those things need to be looked at. The documentation needs to be accounted for. Sure. So it's not as cut and dry as, and as simple as it should be, um, especially when you have people who, who are literally turning in uh, overtime claims for periods uh, in which we need to take a closer look at it. Yeah, but that's my point. Normally management, at least in my experience, and we've run some pretty sizable operations, management authorizes the overtime before it's executed. So management knows, not just depending on the employee, because if I'm going to sit there and ride my overtime, that's where we get in trouble. And I know Mr. Kidd knows of that experience of employees that are stocking up their overtime that they didn't legitimately earn because they simply yeah. want to yeah. and, and know, I take money that they didn't earn. And that I does happen in the government. So there has to be a check and balance of ensuring that management ahead of time authorizes the overtime. So we're not simply at the mercy of employees determining their overtime. I mean, someone has to approve it. That's either their supervisor all the way up to the director's level, right? That's normally standard operating procedures. That's correct. It is standard operating procedures. And I do know that through the director constantly reaching out to management, to supervisors to make sure that staff turn in their, their overtime on a, on a timely basis. I think the, the the case in which a person is just now submitting, I think, is a unique situation. Uh, but on the norm, especially you can tell from our expenditures and burning down monies, that we have been addressing over time frequently. Uh, although we will follow up with Senator uh, Tello's uh, request to have a closer look for the employees to be able to have a, a breakdown on a regular basis. So if I can ask Mr. Blas for the, the amounts that go back a couple of years, how many people are we talking about on average here for that goes back, you know, two or three years almost I, here. I'm not, I'm not certain, Senator, You're but I can aware. get that information for you as to how many people affects, is affected by the 28,000 and the 72,000. The bulk of it, like I said, is just this past fiscal year, right? And, and it was just um, <coughs> the pandemic work, so um, we can get that information for you. We'd appreciate that if yes. you can forward it to, the, yes. to, our, yes. to our speaker and that yes, way we can get the information. I don't have any other questions with regards to this section. Thank you very much, and thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank, thank you, Senator. I just want to note, 
this is not the first time that complaints have come in regarding overtime. So during the pandemic, this was a, well an mm -hmm. issue that they were not being paid right away mm -hmm. or something. But so yeah, your your quickest efforts I would appreciate. Thank yes. you. Yes, yes, ma'am. So you. we're going to move now to the uh, Department of Environmental Health, Mr. Nadeau's section, and I want to congratulate you on the good ratings that you have received. Thank you for providing that to us and for also in your presentation answering the concerns because those are some of the concerns we've received in our office as well particularly the the having to go uh, in order to apply for your health certificates uh, you go to the aganya office and then you have to go up to northern to get your tv clearance and especially now when gas is a issue for everyone and so you've stated that you are working to minimize the travel to the two places so i appreciate that and i hope that that is successful and uh, you're addressing the other concerns. I think it's on us now to con address this treasurer's, uh, the treasurer of Guam not accepting credit or debit payments for these types of services or applications. Actually, the merchant machines are not available at this time for installation at new GovGuam locations. So if we didn't already have one. At new, at new places. Right. So because we don't currently have a machine, oh. we are not it's not available for okay, that us. might be a contract issue all right then yeah i don't have that in okay thanks our senator any other questions from the other senators senator kananta what banking institution is um not acknowledging do you know um it's my understanding it's bank of one okay we will make a call just kidding <laughs> <That'd be all. laughs> thank you senator senator fisher no questions thank you Thank you, Senator Taitigui. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, health certificates, right? Okay. Um, Tom, I have a question with regards to uh, um, your health certificates, including child care facilities and schools. What exactly do you give to the schools in, in regards to health certificates? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Senator? Okay, sorry. Um, regarding your, uh, I don't know what page this is on, actually 53, where you uh, indicate uh, who needs a health certificate. And in, in there, you, you mentioned employees in institution facilities, employees, example, child care facility in schools. Who exactly in the school that needs a health certificate? Is it teachers? Um, is it the Cafeteria, yeah, can you explain, please? Uh, yes, thank you for the question, Senator. That's one of the examples where it's not explicitly stated in our rules and regulations. Mm. So at this time, we're not requiring anyone from uh, the schools to obtain a health certificate. The establishment itself, the schools will require a center permit, but the employees at this time are not required to get a health certificate. Okay, that's all. Oh, go ahead. If, if go ahead. I can add on to that, for those who are providing food service, though, are required to hold a health certificate. So like the cafeteria staff. Yeah, they would. And that is a different category. Yes. Yeah, that's just okay, okay, but that's, that's part of the school. Yes. Right. Okay, well, I'll just leave it at that. I'm sure my colleagues have some more questions with regards to the certificates. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Taitigui. Senator Barnett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to read off some of these comments, uh, these customer service comments into the record if I could. Joanna Jolly Server, uh, Joanna, excellent. Joanna and Esther, great job, ladies. It's a really cute. Marie, who's Marie? Marie has a lot of comments. She's one of our customer service yeah. representatives. Marie was excellent, excellent and quick. Marie was very helpful in providing assistance for my certificate. Uh, keep up the good work, P.S. Maybe more parking. Uh, Marie was very fast, best service since you guys started. I like this because, you know, we hear a lot of complaints from... Uh, people out there about the uh, customer service in the government of Guam, so I think this is really uh, refreshing to see. I did have a question, uh, not rel relative to health certificates, but sanitary permits. So as I know you're aware, I visited uh, Simon Sanchez uh, High School with Senator Sabina Perez uh, the other day, uh, where they're apparently suffering from rat infestation. But uh, one of the um, issues that concerned me was in talking with uh, Principal Carla Mesnayan. Um, she had informed me that the last time that public health had inspected the uh, uh, campus at Simon Sanchez was in 2016. But what I found interesting was that there was a, uh, a current sanitary permit issued to the school. And when I had questioned uh, Principal Mesnayan about that, um, she had said, oh, we get a call from downtown and they say, come pick up your sanitary permit. 
And so I was just wondering if you could uh, maybe explain a little bit about that uh, process so we can have more clar clarification on that, sir? Sure. Yes, of course, Senator. So uh, there is a um, statutory mandate that requires all Santa permits be renewed on June 30th of every year. Uh, there's nothing in our laws, regulations that compels us to or that requires an establishment to be inspected prior to receiving the renewal Santa permit. Now, of course, ideally, uh, it would be great if we could inspect every facility right before we give a renewal to ensure that they met the compliance as that they met first time when they initially apply, and they are required to do that. Uh, but right now, at this time, uh, the law does not require us to do a renewal inspection. Uh, and, and so, uh, if that were to happen, we'll be spending the next, well, several months, if not, well, several months uh, just doing inspection, just giving out renewals. But it's not required by law, any kind, Senator. Well, that's interesting. It's uh, very interesting. But I, I'm, I'm sure you can understand the concern from students, uh, parents, uh, staff, faculty at the school that uh, if we're issuing a current sanitary permit but we're not inspecting the facilities, then uh, in my estimation, the sanitary permit's not really worth the paper it's written on. Well, uh, going back to your comment earlier, Senator, how you mentioned they had not been inspected until uh, 2016, I believe. Uh, Simon Sanchez was one of six pilot projects which we had implemented um, soon after, I believe, that date. Uh, and we did conduct inspection. They were ungraded inspection. The intent of that project was to provide hands-on, direct access, assistance, using the community to, to help comply with the requirements. Um, so there were actually inspections done. In fact, several inspections were done of uh, Simon Sanchez, but that was during what we called a pilot project and where grades were not issued because the focus was trying to assist them to comply and not to, uh, I guess, uh, punt, well, I don't, to cite them per se, but they were cited uh, so they know what their violations were or deficiencies, but they were inspected several times, Simon Sanchez. And I could provide that data if that you're seeking, Senator. Thank you. Uh, do you have any plans uh, to inspect them in the near future? No. So uh, generally, we don't announce when we do inspections, but we do work with GDOE. We have in the past, and as as a courtesy, but also to uh, make it clear that we're here to help them, not to harm them or try to shut down the establishment. We do call, give them advance notice, but it's a notice more to prepare them that they need to get ready because we'll be showing up. Senator, I don't have an exact date as to when we're doing so. We have other commitments and obligations, and a lot of those are like scheduled times and dates, like for issuance of center permit, uh, the inspection. So if we were to focus just on schools, if you will, then all other obligations will need to be canceled or postponed. So we're trying to find a balance of trying to uh, entertain everyone's request. And, but we do recognize the need to go down to Simon Sanchez. And that we will do, Senators. Uh, fortunately, I cannot give you the exact date, uh, but definitely that is in our planning, Senator. Do you believe the uh, Department of Public Health and Social Services, specifically the Division of Environmental Health, has an obligation to conduct uh, frequent inspections of our school facilities? Well, the law manda mandates us to do inspection four times a year of every facility, uh, but it's not a secret that we are not able to meet that requirements. Uh, but we do triage. We prioritize based on the risk to the community. So those that are high risk, like, like uh, the young, the elderly, and the sick, we do focus on that. Uh, but the reality is, um, based on what we've seen, it's, it's every <laughs> inspection is a priority, which unfortunately we have not been able to meet. But we are doing the best, and we prioritize, Senator. Uh, moving to this, the inspection you guys conducted recently of Southern High and, and which they received a D rating. I had also toured Southern High and uh, observed black mold in uh, not only classrooms that aren't being utilized uh, by the school, but also in classrooms that are. Is there any type of uh, testing that public health does uh, in terms of like what kind of mold is that, uh, how harmful it is, or how uh, detrimental it is to have our students uh, breathing that? Sure. Uh, first, uh, regarding black mold, when we inspected it, we acknowledged there were black mold, but just by the color, not the necessary type or species of mold, if you will. Uh, at this time, and it's just not at our level, but generally across the nation, there are no standards for mold. Uh, everyone reacts differently to mold. Some are hypersensitive to it, or others are not. So there are no standards that we're aware of uh, across the nation where uh, they've adopted saying this is a acceptable level or not, just that everyone reacts differently. 
However, uh, obviously mold is a concern, so uh, there is a general requirement that uh, you know, addresses humidity, temperature, which does control uh, mold growth. And we do have that standards in our current regulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Um, Senator Fisher, you have a quick follow-up? <laughs> sir, uh, did I understand you to say that, well, let me ask a preliminary question. What is the purpose of a health certificate? By possessing a health certificate, it attests that you are free of tuberculosis disease at that moment. Mm -hmm. And depending on the category, depending on your employment, that you're free of communicable disease. Okay. I think I misspoke. I guess I meant sanitary permit. Oh, sanitary permit. Yeah. Wow. So sanitary permit, uh, it covers the whole the physical operations as well as the uh, physical requirements and the operations of the establishment. So we look at everything from lighting okay. uh, to uh, water level, uh, I'm sorry, water pressure, uh, down to uh, general cleanliness, specific requirements such as uh, for food facility uh, okay. that have the required is, number. Now is the certificate you issue, is that an official government document? The health certificate or sanitary permit, sir? Right. Sanitary. Yeah, our, I'm sorry, Senator. Our presentation today, we had asked them to talk about the health certificates, and yeah. I allowed a, a, well, some big well, discussion regarding those. I think we're going to get into that in another hearing. Well, yes, ma'am, but I would like to follow up on what, what the gentleman just if said quick, to us. Because there are other senators waiting. Yeah. Yes. Okay. What is your question? All right. Here is my question, Madam Speaker. Uh, you have just testified that the sanitary permit is, in fact, a government document, and I assume that the general population as well as the people who occupy. For example, Simon Sanchez uh, are intended to rely on that. It's a representation by the government of Guam that that institution is safe and clean. I think I understood you to say that a sanitary permit was issued to Simon Sanchez, although you had not conducted the inspection. Is that correct? We did not conduct inspection prior to the issuance of a renewal sanitary permit, Senator. We're not obligated, required to. Ideally, we would love to, to ensure that they met the requirements, are meeting the requirements as when they first got their sanitary permit. So just to reiterate what Senator Barnett said, there is no real reason why the public at large should rely on a sanitary permit? The sanitary permit, the initial sanitary permit when it's issued, it attests that they met all the physical requirements and all the other obligations that's addressed in specific rules and regulations. So when the Santa permit is received, it, entail, it, it, it ensures and it, it does inform the public that it, they have the, the establishment has met the requirements. Now the renewal is just a continuation of that. Fortunately, as I commented, uh, we're not obligated to so. We'd love to, Senator. We, we do. So, well, it's, so it sounds happened. like your answer is yes. Answer is it is valid. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Parkinson. Um, I just got a question about the uh, requirements for health certificates about being free of TB disease. Does that mean that, because I've never had to, I have to get a health certificate before, so um, does that mean that to get a health certificate you're required to uh, get some sort of TB tests? Right. Uh, skin, skin tests. In fact, we have a nurse here, Ms. Margarita Gay, so maybe she can give the details of that, but I can say yes, no to obtain a health certificate. You require a TB test for uh, all employees except for food, food establishment for... So upon initial... Oh, I'm sorry. The I'll initial let, requirement, I mean, the, answer, the simple answer to that is yes, for all, all categories initially. For the food category, for renewal, it's not a requirement. For renewal, it's not a requirement, Correct. just for the initial. Yes. Okay, I got you. And I guess my second question is, um, there's a section here. Uh, first time, issued interim uh, HC pending attendance and passing of training course. Two consecutive non-passing may result in contract between uh, Department of Health Social Services and applicant supervisor. Um, just as a question of processes, what, you know, how many consecutive non-passings do you go, you know, do you typically go through before uh, it's a shall among, you know, internally where you, you do have that contact with the supervisor? Actually, within rules and regs, people can take the test as many times as they'd like. Okay. So, but we do offer um, the contract at the second field if we feel like they can't pass the test, they're not opting to. 
um, keep continuously try, then they do have the option because it is within the rules and regs to offer them the written agreement. Okay, and uh, do you also happen to know just offhand what the, the pass rate is for the first go around? Like how often do people gotta retake it? Um, it the in interim test pass rate is roughly 90%. So okay. pretty high pass rate. All right, thank you. No further questions, Madam Speaker. Senator Parkinson. Senator Knath had a very quick follow-up. Sorry. Uh, as, a, as an alumni of Simon Sanchez High School, I know that we shut down the school. So is that the requirement for you guys to do an inspection um, to reopen the school? So that you guys can have a post, in, you guys would have a pre and post like inspection. When you inspect the, the facilities, if it, if it doesn't meet the requirements, then you guys shut it down, right? And then to reopen the school, it would have to meet your, your standards, correct? At this time, based on our current regulations, mm -hmm. uh, well, let me take a step back, Senator. When, it's, when the establishment is inspected and there are deficiencies, we return for def to ensure that they correct the deficiencies. If the facility is uh, the shut down or when the Santa permit is suspended, mm. we will wait for the business or school mm -hmm. to notify us that they're ready for reinspection. And when we do, uh, if they met all the correct all the deficiencies, then they are re the Santa permit is returned. Uh, we don't return the Santa permit until all the violation deficiencies are addressed. So for uh, sorry. Uh, so Simon Sanchez just needs to be shut down for it to be, I guess, mediate, mediate all its uh, issues and then you guys would re do an inspection. Simon Sanchez at this time has a valid center permit. They are not shut down. But I will say that uh, even if they did receive a, a demerit point equal or worse, equal to D grade, which normally results, which mm -hmm. I actually shouldn't phrase that, by statute automatically results in a closure, then, that will do, then we'll do so. However, the current rules and regulations for school sanitation, there is a provision that explicitly states that, it's, uh, that, it's, uh, that it will not be in effect until five years upon its adoption. So the adoption was in 2019, so it'll be effective and thus enforceable 2023, which is next uh, fiscal year, next calendar year. 2024, my apology. Okay. I know I'm Asian, but my mask was off okay. a little bit. Because it's my 10 year anniversary already for my school, so. You know, we still have the same situation, rats. I didn't join Senator uh, Perez and Senator Barnett on the tour, but I did see the school. And a lot, obviously, the, the school is still in... Um, I, I personally wouldn't want to go to school there anymore. I, I think it's a ridiculous um, government... Excuse my language. Screw up. It continues to be a, um, nonsense after nonsense. And again, we shut down the school in 2014, and it seems like that's the... Bottom line, we just need to shut it down to get it fixed. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Sorry. I'm going to uh, proceed to Senator Brown. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I mean, I certainly want to commend public health with regards to the facilitating of the health certificates. Um, I know it's not on the agenda and you were not asked to present, but obviously this issue with regards to the health certificates is a critical issue and one of concern. And I think the fact that it's been brought up today, the process in place, I mean, it is something we certainly as policymakers, we'll further look into because, I mean, we have hundreds and hundreds of our students that are attending these schools. I know in some cases a lot of the uh, cafeteria work is, is uh, being hired out to vendors that are coming in and providing uh, lunches and breakfast to the students. But again, I mean, it's a legitimate concern. I hope our chairman on education, I'm sure, will follow up and our, our speaker uh, with regards to, to the health committee. Uh, I think we need to dig further into that issue and find out exactly how many schools are being inspected, when they're being inspected, what the record is so far of inspections to all our public and private schools. And it is concerning. I mean, I attended nine years of public school on Guam, and there are many assistants to the assistant positions in administration been created in DOE, and yet, you know, these issues continue to surface. I mean, I don't think we as policymakers are the ones that should be inspecting the schools, but you know, so be it. If that's what it takes to bring these issues to light, then by all means, we need to do it. But I know at another another forum, Madam Speaker, we can further uh, look into the issue with regards to health certificates. I mean, for restaurants and things are important, but even more so for our children. I mean, you you recognize, Mr. Nadeau, that the children there are one of our vulnerable populations. So we definitely want to make sure that there's true follow up and, and actual inspection of these facilities to ensure their safety. So with that, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. One of the reasons we did not include sanitation permits is because I, we have discussed this in previous meetings and oversight hearings, and we understand this is also the topic of an upcoming meeting. 
or hearing. However, um, I just want to state as well that uh, while the division, as you stated, Mr. Nadeau, is mandated um, to inspect and, um, and that you have set these inspections and you, in fact, have a plan to inspect Simon Sanchez coming up, that you have acknowledged in previous, in the past, that there are significant staffing um, issues that your division faces. And we tried to address this in the budget, not fully, of course, but tried. And we also, in recent laws, have allowed an increase in sanitation inspection fees and other fees associated with that as part of the strategic plan of the division to um, increase its personnel. So in the last 30 years, the most that the division had in its staffing pattern was 55 full-time employees. That was in the 90s. And in the fewest was in 2004 when the division had 11 employees. And thus, they have been historically understaffed, but they did, did create a plan to address that and they actually made a very significant step in submitting increased um, uh, regulation and fees so that to, uh, to help assert that, I mean, to address this. And I, I acknowledge all, my senator, all the senator's concerns that this is a huge concern, but I, I also want to acknowledge that the division itself has brought this to our attention many times and that they have been understaffed. And we have, of course, directed this to the director of the Department of Public Health and asked that this be addressed. And so I don't want to address it simply by fees, but transfer of, of um, funding where necessary. And, and director, you missed the part where we were talking about the overtime and that the ARP had been expended, but I hope that we can ask the government for additional ARP funds to pay your overtime and maybe take the funds that you were going to use from your internal and, and address some of these inspection concerns that are very valid. Very valid and I agree the public is relying on these inspections to occur. So, um, Speaker, if I may. Yes. And I, and, I, and I feel compelled to respond because I do understand. Do, can you be just a little louder? Make oh, sure yes. that, yeah. Sure. Good. It's not working. It died. I think. I think they want me to, there we go, no, there we go, okay. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, I feel compelled to speak, and I know this is not the forum for sanitary permit, nor Simon Sanchez, I, I recognize that. But I would like to say that, yes, we have an oblig statutory obligation to inspections, and we do our best. And whether it's Simon Sanchez, other GDO school, or food establishment, ultimately the responsibility falls upon its operator. They have the option, if they so wish, seize operation. If GDOE schools or eating drinking facility wishes to shut down because they have deficiency problems, or operational problems that question the, uh, the safety of the or the community, they have the option to shut down. It doesn't require public health to tell them that they have a problem. They are trained, like the food safety, or as a manager, or as an employee, or as a principal. We have trained all the GDOE principals multiple times of the requirements. So it's not that they don't know these deficiencies and they have the option to take action what they need to do internally. They don't require public health to tell them they have a challenge or a problem. So I apologize for uh, making that comment, but, but I feel compelled to share that with you because uh, ultimately the responsibility does fall on the respected permit holder. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nadeau. We're on the section on uh, the nursing services and the, the central health clinic and um, so I just had one question, and I, I thank you for your presentation about all the services that have been provided and the graph that shows that they had actually, um, despite all your efforts, that they had decreased because, and I want to, can I just take a pause here to just uh, thank you tremendously, especially you, the nursing division, for what you did for us during COVID, for really being uh, the frontliners for us in and doing things that had never, ever been done on Guam before. And so really being... Um, strategic in that and experimental and using yourselves. And I, I want to acknowledge Ms. Uh, Ms. Gay, she is actually the administrator, but 
I think you were there when I was being tested in that long line, and you were, you were one of the nurses doing all of that frontline work. So I want to thank you, all your nurses, and all of public health, of course. But I, I, I remember that very clearly. We have not forgotten. So thank you very much. My concern is that, uh, you know, we, we, we are all aware that the central clinic has been closed, so um, you are now providing your services, nursing services, out of the northern clinic, but we can see from this chart they've been significantly decreased, and you acknowledge the closure of the central facility, and um, uh, of course, you know, the diversion of staff to other duties during COVID, but uh, I want to ask you, so the public auditor also sent an audit uh, regarding the leasing of public facil or facilities for the government and recommended that uh, public health in particular um, re Public Health has stated they have no plans to move back to the Manginal Main Facility. Instead, Bill Number 296-36 proposes the transfer of Public Health Manginal Main Facility property to GCC to construct a nursing annex. As a result, Public Health will continue to be the top GovGuam agency paying the highest annual lease cost of $2.8 million. Therefore, to reduce Public Health's office lease costs, we recommend the GovGuam invest in the repair of the Manginal Main Facility and for Public Health to retain ownership and occupancy of the property. So that's one issue is the cost, but my biggest concern is, is the nursing services. And so we had also been informed that there was a, a relatively new lab in that facility, in the central facility, but do you, do you think that um, uh, doing what the public auditor recommends will result in improved services versus the status quo um, working out of your current location? I guess that's the question. I can only speak to me. Uh, um, can you make it louder, please? Oh, Just sorry. speak into it. Um, the, the facility that we had was unique, and I if we if it was possible if we could get the same space uh you know the clinic was we were able to immunize treat std and people knew it and, and knew that that was the area if we we just need the space uh to continue our services um i, I like the location because it's central uh, people uh, from both sides are, will be able to. And um, it was also a way where all the resources, well, the other programs that relate to our, program, to our clinic services were available, like the TB was in the clinic. And if you get your um, health certificate, you just walk downstairs. And so I see that it would help. And then if our children need a, to get uh, a lab test, they would just walk down the hall, um, get a birth certificate, you know, it's just down the hall. Um, but it would be, uh, my own opinion, it would be nice to get back if it's restored and, uh, f you know, uh, f um, clean up, uh, you know, the, make, you know, cha make the, the, the changes that needs to be changed. And I would, we would, or I would appreciate it. Uh, but again, I leave it to our, our leaders to find, uh, to find this best solution for us. Thank you very much. Um, and other questions regarding nursing services in particular? Senators, are there any? Any questions regarding nursing services? Uh, all right, Senator uh, Fisher. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I have a, a few questions about nursing services. Mm -hmm. uh, nursing, you have on page, well, it's not marked, but nursing services within the MCH clinic. What's MCH stand for? 
Maternal Child Health Programs. It's a Title V. Okay, I'm uh, sorry. You're... Maternal Child Health Program. Okay, thank you. Title V. Um, do you provide, I see that under that you have adolescent, an adolescent health clinic, family planning, counseling, and prevention education, physical exams. Uh, do you provide uh, contraception? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you provide uh, contraception services to adolescents? Yes. I'm sorry? Yes. Okay. Now, I'm, you don't require parental permission, do you? No. Okay. Um, do you uh, provide uh, reproductive, uh, women's reproductive services? Yes. I'm sorry? For, yes. Okay, could you describe what those services are? Uh, since we have a um, nurse practitioner and now we partnership with uh, an OBGYN with the Northern, it can vary from uh, uh, bleeding. Um, with this, what? With, um, what do you call it, menstruation issues. Uh, they don't do preconception, uh, not too much, but they can counsel on it uh, because our facility is mostly um, related to pregnancy. But the doctor, the OBGYN is able to uh, do more, like cancer screening, we do that. Okay, I'd, um, I'll ask you a question yeah. about that, but well, do you provide abortions? No. No. And why is that? In our family planning program, mm -hmm. uh, it's, against the it's Title, 10. Title Ten doesn't um, promote or or even speak to that. Is Title Ten, uh, I guess, attached to or dependent upon federal funds? Yes. yes. Doesn't the government of Guam have non-federal funds that it could use to provide abortion services? I'm not, I'm not sure, sir. Um, well, could you look into that? Yeah. I think that there's a sizable no, amount of people in the population that would be interested yeah. in that. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, yeah. you also, um, uh, you just mentioned the cancer. Do you uh, do HPV uh, yes. vaccinations? Yes, we okay. do. For male and female? Yes. Okay. And, and uh, what about hearing and vision? Hearing? Hearing oh. and vision. Uh, so we do the newborn screening hearing. So when they come for their royal baby checks, we uh, conduct those hearing tests. Um, if we, they need further referral, we, we refer them to the Guam Eddy program. And what about Vis vision? Pardon me? Vision? Yes, vision, it's part of the child health physical exams. Okay. Uh, or the, we do it in TB clinics because Sometimes during TB, they, it, it uh, affects your vision. Okay. So, and then, yes. Thank you. And then I'm just going to return to the uh, concept of the HPV vaccines. Uh, I think, as we all know, HPV is intimately linked to cancer okay. later yes. in life, um, cervical and esophageal, et cetera, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and as I understand it, the vaccine basically needs to be administered prior to sexual activity. Uh, among uh, adolescents. Yeah. Is that, that correct? Yeah, because we give it at 10. The first dose is 10 years old. Okay. And, and they're saying that if we give the, vi the, the immunization, it will prevent that mm -hmm. once they start. So the main thing is get them before they yeah. do their first intercourse. So, yeah. uh, and that is because the human papillomavirus is transmitted True. primarily sexually, right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend, based on the fact that you are a healthcare professional, uh, in your professional opinion, would you recommend that, and maybe they do, I hope they do, the Department of Education require HPV vaccines as a condition of admission to um, our public schools? Uh, right now, it's, it's, it's only highly recommended. It's not part of the, the, you know, the required immunization, but we've been, uh, it would, our, Immunization program and ourselves have wanted some a little bit more uh, stringent uh, requirements in okay. the mean, you adolescents. Have, you have area. to have a vaccine for mumps and rubella and so mm -hmm. forth, right? Yeah. So it seems to me that it just makes sense that HPV yes. vaccines should be required. Yeah. It'll, it'll save a, a lot, a lot in, uh, in yes. grief as well as money. Yeah. But yeah. Anyway. I know we had, um, this is, uh, 
the public, uh, the Catholic schools, when we were giving it, they didn't want. So that's why um, there's the, a. <laughs> yeah. sorry, the, the Catholic schools did not want HPV vaccines for yeah, the, the children? Said, yeah. Did we, they have any sort of rational reason for that? Uh, it, uh, I'm not sure if it's about, we're talking about you can have sex or, I'm not sure okay. what they meant, but I they, they, per, they literally told us, please don't bring that in, in, in one of the Catholic, couple of Catholic high schools. But wow. uh, well, if you do it by law, then they can't, they can't change it. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. But thank you for your answers. Okay, thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator Fisher. Senator Barnett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ma'am, could you please uh, uh, maybe uh, speak a little more on the mortality review? Oh, um, I have Maggie. She's the project director. Thank you. Hi, Maggie. Thank you. Hi. Our, our maternity mortality review is a brand new grant that we just received in October from CDC. And what it is is to establish a review committee to review all maternal deaths, which is from a mom pregnancy through one year after birth. In 2021, we had eight mothers who passed away during that time period. Luckily for 2021, we only had two moms that passed away. So the whole thing is to gather uh, OBGYNs, uh, our new medical examiner, definitely, our territorial epidemiologist, maternal child health program, to select and review all these deaths and why moms were dying. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Senator Parkinson, any questions? Uh, no, my questions were asked. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Senator Brown? Thank you. All right, the next uh, topic is the, the Northern and Southern Health Clinics, the Community Health Centers. And uh, thank you, Doctor, and welcome thank to Guam, you. and welcome to these health centers. Thank you for being there for us. Um, yeah, I raised this issue because we, yeah, we were concerned that, uh, of course, because of the pandemic, everything had to shift. But now that uh, the emergency is over, we wanted to be ensured, in particular, that the Southern Region Health Center is is back up to speed. So you testified that only pediatrician, pediatric care, is allowed out there right now because of the shortage of doctors but that in the north, you are able to do pediatric, adult, and you do have a pharmacy and a lab. Because in the south, there's no pharmacy, no lab right now due to shortage of personnel. Right. Um, uh, actually, in our pharmacy, it reopened once a week, like every Wednesday. So as I mentioned in the presentation, we're slowly resuming those services in both the north and the south. And um, uh, as a matter of fact, we will be meeting with our providers, uh, with our uh, providers uh, next week to look at our staffing pattern to ensure that we could provide um, both, again, the scope of pediatric and adult uh, care in the South. All right, thank you. Is there any part of this type of grant that uh, you work under or the grants that uh, will address the transportation issue that the patients are having? Um, to the best of my knowledge, we, we don't provide that, but uh, I, I believe this is an opportunity for us to work with um, you know, partners in, our communi in the community. And um, as a matter of fact, um, Mr. Carlos and I had been talking about it and uh, to see how um, also with the Medicaid office could um, support us in ensuring that the patients who would just need transportation or maybe expand our telehealth services that we continue to bring um, you know, primary care to them. Okay. Yeah. And, um, sorry. Yes, Director. Yeah, Madam Speaker, uh, you know, we were going through this issue, and I think it really brought all my different divisions together, and we're hearing each other's concerns and challenges and accomplishments, and, and what it's also bringing to light is our internal process to really talk more and more to each other. We now have conversations going on with our new CEO for Community Health Center, with Carlos, who's our acting chief for Division of Public Welfare, and looking at the Medicaid. Medicaid can but today it doesn't because our state plan prohibits us. We wrote it in that way, Guam wrote it that way, that we don't provide transportation, although it is a permissible expenditure. So Carlos and Dr. Young are going to be talking about how do we make this happen, amend the state plan. Again, like Carlos shared earlier, it's not just about writing a state plan amendment, it's also getting public input and going through that process. So it's gonna be months out. 
but we are looking at when it was written, there was a different group of people perhaps with a different set of perspectives. But we do know is people aren't going, we have no shows. They're not making to their, to their appointments. We know there are critical service areas that we need to provide some assistance to to get access. And so we're looking at what, in terms of Medicaid coverage, we could use for that, at least for our Medicaid population. And we're also looking perhaps, as we always do, what we do in Medicaid, if you're not on Medicaid and you're MIP, what can we mirror in MIP and Medicaid? So, so both populations are going to be able to have access. So uh, it's very early in our conversation. And again, it will require a state plan amendment. Uh, but it's something that Carlos and I and, and Dr. Young just started talking about very recently, just as a result of us just getting ready for this presentation. And it's bringing to light how much more we have in terms of our capacity and just our need to network just in, within our own department. So I just wanted to share that with you. We are looking at okay. that. Thank you. That sounds great. Thank you. And um, so back to the Southern Health. Yeah, so the particular concern was that uh, patients would come in and then they'd be in need of a lab in order for the doctor to do a further assessment, but they can't get that at that moment. They'd have to go somewhere else, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's the issue because especially they are monomco, so please just pay attention to that as well when yes, you're looking sir. at their Medicaid. And, um, but you're, you, I, I'm grateful that you laid out your plans and what you're trying to address uh, immediately coming up mm -hmm. and your current operations and uh, improving technology, all of that. And, uh, but this last one where you say, explore semi-autonomous status. Mm -hmm. This is one of the reasons why I, I asked for this topic as well, because if the, the concern is more timely recruitment or competitive salaries, what is the impediment? Why is the department not able to do that with uh, like the rest of the government of Guam, uh, you know, when there's a dire need for recruitment in specialized areas that, that do you need additional authority? Because we could address that right away. And I've asked exactly what it is that is impeding that. And um, so I'd like to know that before we go for semi-autonomy, I'm not sure mm -hmm. how that makes it any quicker. If the issue is processing recruitment or being competitive enough in salaries. So director. Yes, yeah, so with regards to the community health centers, north and south, as they are funded at HRSA, they're also generating program income. And so, they, as Dr. Milai Young has shared, uh, over $2 million has been raised throughout the years. In one year, in 2016, it was quite high because of back buildings that were caught up. But having said all that, uh, I did talk to Dr. Milai, and we're going to be exploring. We got to first explore the, the HRSA requirement and making sure that the, one of the primary funding sources, which is from Health Resource Service Administration, is in line with us being able to be semi-autonomous. Uh, they are a nonprofit organization. I don't want to say that we need to change any legislation right now without working with, through and with the board. Uh, the board does have more of an advisory function. However, they do need, through their own legislation, have to approve the spending of funds up to 5,000 or more. So more recently, we were in the process of recruiting a physician and the board was hesitant to pay the re requested rate that we felt was reasonable. Uh, eventually they came around and they agreed to pay that rate. So that contract was somewhat delayed because the board also has influence over these contracts with regards to the program income side of the funding source. Having said all that though, moving forward, that contract is now moving, I think it's at the AG's office, kid? Um, I, I believe mm -hmm. it's at the Attorney General's office, so hopefully, uh, it gets reviewed soon and uh, we get that physician on board and we are also just working i just came from another meeting and we have two physicians which i have not had a chance to talk with dr young yet uh, we're interested in working at the health centers part-time and so that that's just a new development plus the one that i went to go meet the uh, gynecologist oncologist uh, who's here visiting and so we're, we're looking always to, to see who we can bring on board even specialty and so I'm calling Carlos, but uh, of course we're here and we'll explore that further and get back with you, man. All right, well, I appreciate that. And if you're able to get some other funding by being semi-autonomous, then that's of yeah. course, uh, we'll take a look at that. It's the board members, however, this advisory commission who have come to me and they're also very concerned about the recruitment of doctors. I mean, they know that mm -hmm. is their number one concern. So. Right. Um, and so we also need the board members to endorse these contracts. Yes. And so they're, they're asking well, for... So, okay, sorry. yeah, they want us to resolve the yeah. 
who has the authority for what, but I, I understand now from your explanation what the issue may be. Uh, we will discuss that further. Thank you. Uh, okay. Any other questions regarding the community health centers? Senator Barnett. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, you said Southern Community Health Center only provides pediatric care? Currently, it's pediatric care. That's how, right. How long has it only been providing pediatric care? Um, to the best of my knowledge, it's when uh, we resumed our operations, um, you know, after the staff have been pulled out to work for COVID. But uh, I would say it was just temporarily when they um, had to pull out staff. Uh, I would say that in the beginning of COVID that it might have been um, just the pediatric care because of staffing issues, you know, they've been pulled to assist with the COVID response. Uh, yeah, so. so three years, uh, ma'am? Three years. Three years. So can can you share, uh, is there a timeline um, for uh, the Southern Health uh, Community Health Center to start accepting other types of uh, patients for other types of care? Um, I would be optimistic that we would resume those services in the next three to six months. And like I mentioned, we will be meeting with our providers next week. And that's on the top of our list, you know, to address, to make sure that we um, we provide uh, or expand the uh, uh, adult care services because there's also a need there, as well as um, prenatal care, you know, and women's health. And um, I, it might be ambitious for the three to six months, but I'm optimistic that we could do that. Well, I, I hope my, my fellow Southerners heard that, and uh, we'll, we'll be sure to hold you guys to that. Yes. Um, I wanted to also ask, I uh, recently attended the inauguration of the CNMI uh, government uh, officials. And I noticed that they have public dialysis uh, centers, at least one public dialysis center in the CNMI. Are there any plans or do we offer those types of services uh, under the public health umbrella? And if uh, we don't, are there any plans to maybe offer those types of services? Or, yeah, Carlos, thank you. Well, my director just kind of pointed to me because I used to work at GMH. Um, I've been a budget analyst in healthcare for a while. In any case, uh, the last time we had outpatient dialysis was probably in 2011 at GMH. That was stopped. Uh, the claim was at that time was that uh, it was a money losing venture. Um, in my own personal opinion, I, you know, differs a little, but that's where we're at at this point. But do you believe it's time to re-engage in that conversation given that we have, uh, you know, very concerning numbers of, you know, people who are either uninsured or on Medicaid, Medicare? I think it's a worthwhile discussion and I think that the policy makers should, you know, consider what options there are, both private and public. Uh, if I may add, I've heard uh, GMH also is, you know, they, they do discuss this. Uh, they do, of course, inpatient, in-house uh, mm -hmm. dialysis for their patients that are in, but they, they have been discussing again whether to reopen or not uh, outpatient dialysis. Okay. I also wanted to ask, um, given that you're only offering pediatric care at the mm -hmm. Southern Community Health Center, has that led to an well, obviously, it's led to an increase of patients at the Northern Clinic. What I want to know, and you talked about people not showing up for appointments, what about mm -hmm. uh, wait list, wait time? What can you tell us about that? Our wait time, um, I would say it would be, uh, you could be seen the same day because we accept walk-ins. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Taitigui. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, uh, Ms. Young, what is your budget made up of uh, in your department? Um, how much of it is federal and how much is the general fund money? Mm -hmm. um, okay, 100% federal. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, speaker, thank you so much. No, so I, it is 100%. Well, how much is it that you'll be receiving on not including any additional funding that was given due to COVID, uh, but after COVID is, so, you know, all that money is gone, what do you stand to anticipate uh, yearly in funding from the federal side? Um, Senator, I wish it's, uh, it's an information that I know given my third week in the, in the job, okay. but I, I am in the process of um, obtaining that information because, again, if we are looking at increasing cost of care, so we got to make sure that we have you know, enough funding, whether it's coming from HRSA or generating program income, 
um, you know, to, to provide uh, or, or to um, support the cost of our operations. And uh, I would have to get back to you on that information. So you don't even know how much you receive yearly from your funds now? Uh, we do. So in the graph that I provided, um, uh -huh. those are, again, from HRSA. So last year, our number, our, our fund is at $2.4 million okay. for 2022. Sorry. Yes, for, that's for 2022. And it's about $2.7 million in 2021 and $3 million in 2020. Okay. And this is all strictly just re regular funding that comes in yearly. It has nothing to do with COVID? There okay. is some supplemental so funds. Yes. Okay. Yeah, please. Not at the degree of when we had COVID and it was at the height of COVID. So we had roughly you look, they'll get over two, almost $3 million. And Yearly. that's from HRSA funding, right? Okay. And then the program income is separate and that's generated right. at both health centers, north and south. Okay, so, well, so I guess we'll go through that on your budget. Streams, when right? budget time comes, you are going to get those specific oh, numbers into. Yes, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. the other question I had is, um, I, I'm sorry, Madam Speaker, if I missed it, but um, the public health building in Manila, the clinic there that was shut down, it was said in the paper that public health has said it has been condemned. I sent a letter to D DPW in, um, I believe, uh, uh, the 35th Guam or 36th Guam legislature asking for their uh, comments on whether it was condemned or not, because the rumor was it was condemned. I received a letter from DPW and the, and the fire department that it was never condemned. The building was never condemned. And I, I know that Speaker read from the OPA's uh, um, analysis on, on how to move forward and you know reduce costs um, and the conveniency of, of the centralized area that you mentioned earlier. Not only that, but if you look at the, you know, the diagrams that were provided, and I'm sorry, some of it is very light that I can't read, hmm. you'll see that before um, it was closed down, you had quite a bit, and I do understand that people were staying home, hibernating because of COVID and didn't right. want to come out in the first place. But there was a high rate of individuals going to the Manila, uh, Manila facility because of its convenience, you know. So knowing that and getting a letter from DPW saying that it's not condemned, then why isn't, many, uh, why isn't public health uh, putting any effort into you know, fixing the facility and providing some uh, additional, um, not rooms, but you know, accommodations to make it a, a safer place for the employees? I know it doesn't have any windows, and maybe it's time to put some windows in or do something like that to bring the light in, you know, give a more friendlier atmosphere for the employees as well as those who visit. So what is your plan? All right. So what we have going on right now is a two-pronged approach. We have a bit that is out, and it's being further refined, and that is just for all the federal grants. We're working on a second bid for office space. These are both for office space lease, and it's for all the locally funded parts of public health in terms of their operations. And so what we're looking is to actually put programs out in the community, and in terms of uh, Administrator Gay's comment about office space, that is what we're actually working with each federal program to say, what is your office space requirement? And we're putting it out on bid. Now, when you put it all together as one bid package, we're over 100,000 square feet is our requirement. The Manila Central Public Health Facility total square footage was 75,000. And even when we were there, we didn't fit inside that same building. Senior citizens wasn't in there, immunization wasn't in there, uh, BASA, which is CPS and foster care payments wasn't in there, HPLO wasn't in there. So WIC was in TISA, and so even at 75,000, very, very, Clearly, we need more than 100,000 square feet. And in working with GSA, they're like, Director, there's, there's just no facility, single story, multi-story, that can meet putting all the public health together in one building, multi-story or not. So we broke the um, lease process into two, two, different approach, two different groups, the federal and that's moving forward. And then we're finalizing the one for the local site. And uh, that's our plan is to have us become uh, tenant until the new medical complex is built, and then we will move in there, and that's where we'll put the entire public health and social services. Short of the community health centers, we're not moving the community health centers into the uh, new medical complex. We'll continue to maintain the community health centers in the north, in Dededo, and in the south, in Alaha. Uh, but that's our plan moving forward, Senator. Uh, right, I'm listening intently for oh, the sure. part where you to tell me what you're gonna do with Manila. Well, Manila has already been earmarked for the nursing annex for GCC. Uh, I'm sorry? 
the, uh, as a speaker had referenced in the audit report by the OPA, Mingilao has been earmarked for GCC's nursing Why annex. would you give that up, that Mingilao facility up? Well, the Mingilao facility and as it much was as... Doing, it was doing it, you're, you're talking about putting everything in one area. That's right. very convenient, right. you know, to do that. But that's not going to happen for quite a bit of time. Right. You know, in the meantime, you have the ability, you have a facility right now that hasn't been condemned, that can be repaired with ample parking, yes. that's obviously proved itself as an, an excellent area location for our community. And, and yet, you know, you're, you want to give it to GCC? Well, I, I think we also need to go back and look. Um, do, Margaret... do you have any plans at all? Just answer that question. Do you have any plans at all in taking back, G, not taking it back, but maintaining the Manila facility and repairing it and putting uh, your offices in there like you did before? We're looking at that as a possibility. But it's, 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 we're as looking a possibility. at as a possibility. So how far are you then well, there's, there's, there's GCC several, there's this several building steps, then? Senator, what is the percentage? So for example, uh, yeah. to, to rebuild, this is a concept that we're exploring. If we put our federal programs in there, we gotta make sure the federal programs can also maintain the structure. Because for many years, what was absent in public health and social services main facility is we had all these federal programs in there. No one paid for maintenance. Very few, maybe environmental health, would pay for janitorial services on its own because they wanted additional janitorial services. So we're really looking how we can reach the approaches more comprehensively. Like if we're gonna move there and we're gonna fix it, we gotta find a funding source. Are the federal grants in a position to do that and then also maintain that structure? But what also is not being shared is that the structure also had limitations. We had perpetual water leaks, it was too small for the I number of people. I understand that. Has so, there ever been an assessment on how to, I mean, have you moved forward in uh, doing an assessment on what is really needed at the facility? Um, have you put a plan together on the cost of maintenance uh, once you get into the Menino facility so yeah, you we, can maintain no. the building? Yeah. You know, with the public... Oh, yeah, I, I'm, uh, one more thing. Sure. I'm just hearing you that you're not, you haven't done anything, and I'm looking, I'm hearing that you're, you want to give this to GCC, like almost 95%. Mm -hmm. You are already made up your mind to give it to GCC. You know, um, if there's legislation that needs to be created that you keep the Manila's facility to rebuild it, to help provide you that funding, whether through grants or what, then that, so be it. But you shouldn't be giving away, you know, a facility that's under your jurisdiction to someone else when you need the space. You're all over this island right now. We've always now. been all over the island, exactly Senator. Exactly my we point. So no, you can't even, make... even before Central Public Health came, exactly. Senator. Exactly. Let's be and fair to this point. conversation. Central Public say, Health was never able to accommodate the entire it. staff of Public Health and Social Services. All right? Exactly. So I, I just want to go on record that. for that because it's almost as if, well, Director, you're moving everybody out. We're trying to bring everybody in. There just isn't a 100,000 square feet right. building available right now in one general area. And so GSA is that. advising us that, you know, right. Director, you might need to break this into two parts so that, and you have to decide, well, which programs would you like together? So we've already gone through that process. Yeah, but here's yeah. the thing. You're paying rent on those other facilities. This is a facility you don't have to pay rent on. But we should pay maintenance for, to pre maintain oh, the facility, right? Just like but in order to get the facility there, we yeah. need to make the initial investment. Yeah. And I don't know that my programs are, that I'd like to move in there, if that becomes another possibility or future possibility, are able to absorb that cost. Well, our, uh, and, and I'm sorry, Madam Speaker, if I, you know, moving on, but I'll, I'll end here with the fact that, you know, the OPA has also mm -hmm. shown you why it's more important to keep the Manila facility cost-wise. And we're all talking about a, a cost issue. So um, please look into that because I'm not giving up on that facility there. It's centralized, et cetera. Okay, the other, go, go ahead. Please. Oh, sorry. Please, please proceed. Um, the other one I had was just uh, Ms. Young with regards to this one diagram that you provided us. Um, what is the issue with this section here? It's the diagram where it says um, CHC program income 2012-2021. Can you explain again what the issue is with regarding to this graph? Because when you were explaining it, you mentioned that there is an issue here and that we're looking into it. Is this CHC? Oh, so, so. So, so Dr. Young, can you explain on this one, please? Yes, sir. 
Uh, so the, the slide or the, the copy that you saw is um, so it's to demonstrate the amount of grants that uh, oh sorry the amount of income um, generated by the community health center. So this is the combined uh, north and south. Oh, I and see. so over the years, um, it's it's increasing. It could be because uh, our fee schedule automatically increase every year. So when we bill, for example, Medicaid, um, so um, we're not stuck like for the same rate last year. So um, we we get that increase also on the rates, and. Um, Again, this is the gross program income. And uh, to explain on the peak on the 2016, so that was just a single spike. Right. And that was when, um, again, we were cited by HRSA that we have not been sending out our, our claims you know, to the payers and it's probably um, sitting on someone's desk. And um, so we acted on it by um, hiring you know, our own billing staff and um, eligibility specialist so that uh, they themselves could um, so we could work on those uh, claims submitted for you know for reimbursement and at the same time we look at the um, the uh, the patients who have um, uh, that we have to recover payments or we have to collect payments from so that's one of the other things that they started doing um, however we still encounter patients that we, we can't identify as a truly an inability to pay for some of those collectibles or a refusal to pay. But what our staff does is at every encounter, they review eligibility and ask them, you know, has there been a change in your insurance coverage? And they still, uh, they look at um, if they become eligible or continue to be eligible with our sliding fee discount program. So we still collect um, some bit of like money f from those services. I see, thank you, Dr. Young. And, and I'm concerned because, you know, it's starting to spike up again. You know, if you look at 2021, we haven't seen 2022. So I appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Yeah, thank, thank you, you. Senator. Did you have a question? Senator Parkinson. Yeah, I just have a question regarding the uh, northern and southern uh, clinics. Mm -hmm. um, I just have a question as to uh, the community demand on those uh, places. Because I know we got one up north and we got one down south. But I mean, how adequate are they really for the demand? Uh, so that, that's really a good question, and um, I, I was reading over uh, one report that we pulled out from our system, and uh, it actually provided us um, the number of patients uh, based on their zip code. So I could, you know, put that one together and see where really the patients are coming from. But um, we know that majority of our, our, the North is densely populated, and so that's why we see most of these patients, you know, service in the North. Um, but in other, in, in, in other areas, um, we may have to look at, again, uh, that, uh, that um, portion of the population and uh, so that we could you know, adequately plan like, in the future on when, where will we conduct, say, if we can't physically build our clinics there, then maybe we do more often our portable care clinics. And um, again, the telehealth that I mentioned earlier that we would you know, continue to, um, you know, to provide to our patients. All right, um, and uh, just for up north, uh, in terms of demand, do you think th that necessitates um, the potential for more clinics to be built up north to, to meet that demand? And does the, the, does the South have the same, uh, you know, like I, just in my own layman mm -hmm. reading of the, of the clinic uh, situation, it seems to me we at least need two more up north and at least one more down south mm -hmm. and at least two or three down here in Central. Um, so, I mean, you know, is, is there any way um, you guys will be able to, you know, ramp up your, uh, your, 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 your clinic capacity to mm -hmm. meet the demands of the community? Or are we, are just, are we at a perpetual, um, la you know, uh, lack of uh, service for the demand? Mm -hmm. And so that's something that we are truly li looking into because if we talk about you know the services we provide, we want to increase access to care, and that the the way we're going to provide access to care will really be based on um, where we could strategically you know. Um, offer them, whether it's on the location, its availability, or the type of specialties or the, 
the, ex the extent of the primary care service um, that you know, we, we offer. And um, we would have to look into our data to guide us on where, we, where will be the future of the community health centers. Like, um, like as we mentioned, currently we have North and South. Um, we are really looking into how we could expand it in other areas or maybe we could be a bit more creative in that or innovative in, in such a way that we maybe just do telehealth and uh, but it is truly something that we are um we will be looking into because again we're we're look we're reviewing the data and that will guide us on how we would move forward our our expansion of services all right um may i request if you have that data when you guys do get yes. that data compiled you please transmit it to the okay. chairman on health so we can share it with the rest of us i'd be very interested in that data yes thank you very much no further questions from me thank you senator parkinson senator brown Okay, so we're going to proceed to the, uh, but that that just reminded me, those uh, director. So if if I could just get a copy of the justification for one central facility for all federal programs, and and then one for all local programs that you just described, and then the justification. This is from a prior hearing, maybe even two years ago. You promised a justification for uh, the need for all of public health to be located together with the hospital. Thank you. So we're gonna proceed now to the food and commodities. So um, thank you for the update on that. Uh, have there been any awards? Just want to clarify, were there any awards? There were a total of seven uh, applicants in which six of them were approved, uh, five of them uh, paperwork and documents, the required documents were completed and forwarded out. None of them have been awarded yet. We do share with you the passion of getting this out into the community, but there were a series of delays in the process. Uh, part of that had to do with uh, the required documents. Part of that had to do with some budget modifications for each of the nonprofit organizations. And, uh, and some of it had to do with the fact that some of the nonprofit organizations actually had off island governing bodies. And then they had then had their legal system look at the required documents as well. So it is moving along. We have had conversations with the different agencies that are reviewing it. And uh, everyone shares the passion to move it forward. Well, uh, but as much as we want to move it forward, there was a process that had to be followed. All right, so I can see what you're describing to be the delay from when, when you did your announcement and you received the, or you extended the deadline, you received it and you did an announcement in July, so 22 until now. Uh, delay in getting template grant agreements and, and back and forth regarding documentation. But I think to say that there was a delay is really an understatement in this case because the funding was done in a bill in March 2021. That was supposed to be five million. So not only was it delayed, but it, it the law says five million. What you received was 3.1 million so far. That's correct. And I don't understand that. I actually feel this was supposed to be something urgent to be done during the middle of COVID and it was for food. Yes. And so I kind of find it unconscionable and I love you guys. So I know that not all of this is, you know, on you, but it, it really is unconscionable. So 5 million went to 3.1 million. The explanation I received from you in previous hearing is that's all that BBMR gave you. That's now we're back to, after all of this delay, it looks like, uh, well, it took one year and three months to establish the fund. It took one year to announce the grant after the fund was established. It took, up to now, uh, six months from July 2022 to now, that we're still reviewing agreements. And now, the most recent is on February 2, which was yesterday, agreements transmitted to BBMR for review. Why is BBMR back in this process at this point again? I mean, we've already sent these to the AG's office, it looks like, and I don't understand. Why, why are you back there? What does that really mean? Are we, this food, I, I, I don't know, it's food. And it really makes us look like, um, uh, we, you know, uh, 
like the people should not have confidence in the government to respond quickly to this type of a need or, or else, you know, perhaps we should have structured it differently, but I really thought public health is really in tune with the needs of the people. They had already partnerships with nonprofits and are able to get this. We know how to get food out to the people. We've also had our mayors get food out to the people. We've had our schools get food out to the people. But, um, you know, being unable to respond quickly in the time of an emergency or with food shortage, I think, is, is really critical. Um, so, yeah, why are we back at BBMR? Yeah, Senator Chair, I absolutely do hear you, and we, we understand and, and we partner with you in the emergency of all this. And although the bill was passed in March of, of 2021, you're looking at a whole year later before the monies were even made available. And of course, that brings us to June of 2022. And we did act expeditiously in that wanting to make sure that, that we did our, our public service announcement and wanting to reach out to the community, and we moved forward from there. And, and that's correct. Although we didn't have very many applicants, we extended it by a, a week, and we were able to, to get our seven. So that, that was moving along. We did, of course, partner with the Office of the Attorney General, and. Uh, developing and crafting the contract that actually was a, a process uh, in itself and uh, and then they just moved us forward in which we were required to do uh, affidavits and a declaration and uh, some of that processing with the different nonprofits uh, didn't come back in a timely manner uh, again some governing bodies were located off island some people were going through a change of management uh, is a series of things some of that beyond our control, but we kept with it, and we, we moved it forward the best we could, uh, and this is where we're at today. Um, and uh, emergency, absolutely. And wanting to get food into the mouths of children and families. Deputy Director, just yes, when were the awards made? So you, your deadline for receiving grant applications was July 2022. When were the awards made? The awards made to each of the nonprofit organizations? Yes. I, it's going through the process. It, it does, the documents do go back to the Office of the Attorney General. Are there awards made? Like I had mentioned earlier, no, there's none. I thought you said yes. Okay, so my mistake. So there are no awards yet. So yes, there's still, we went to the AG's office. Can you just tell me why we're back at BBMR for a review of agreements? Right, there, there are signatures required on the document process as well. That's, that's what we're following, the process. And then it will go over to the Office of the Attorney General as well. But didn't you work with the Attorney General? That's correct. They actually, they, they stepped in, they provided guidance on how to develop the contract. So since, so these were not developed prior to the receiving their actual applications or receiving whatever you, you solicited. And that was done in July, and it's now February of the next year. All right, yeah, I, I, I'm still not going to understand that delay. That uh, does not seem adequate, in my opinion. Of course, you know this. And uh, so when do you expect this food to get out to the people? You know. I I'm, and I, and I would only be able to offer my opinion, but I want to see if it will be launched in March uh, to allow it this month to be, to be circulated and signed off on, right. uh, to be able to uh, have an actual schedule, put together a schedule for each of the uh, nonprofit organizations so that we can announce them into the community uh, and that people can know where sites to go to for food and commodities. All right. And, um Director, is there any progress in following up on the rest of the five million? Actually, um, we all request for an explanation because I did reach out to the uh, director of BBMR and he said that is all that we'll be getting based on the, his conversation with me. I'll get that in writing and I can share that. I'll ask him more further. Right, just remind him that his conversation with you to give you 3.1 out of five, the five yeah. is very clearly appropriated. Yeah. And that was based on their calculations of how much we would receive or savings we okay. would be receiving in refinancing a bond. So I would really like to know if there's any real justification for that or well, they're just yeah. well, at their whim denying you the rest of the five okay. million. I will confer with um, the director of uh, BBMR and the director of DOA on that and yeah. provide and, you uh, a response. 
you know, um, yeah, I guess in retrospect, we, we're going to consider a new way, right, to get food out. Um, yeah, we're going to have to see. But right now, we've had that money. It needs to be out there. I think people are still facing this shortage. Do oh, you well, agree? Yes, yes, we agree. There is still food insecurity. And I'm so, yes, I'm agree. working with the deputy, asking him some of the very questions you're asking. It's really just to lay out when can we see the first rollout of the food insecurity. I know. March 2021. Till today. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Any other questions on that topic? Senators? Senator Fisher. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, listening to this conversation uh, got me interested in this issue. Um, the Food and Commodities Grant, was that, did that come about uh, because of a recognition or a notion that there was an emergency in food security on Guam? My understanding is that it came about from the legislative body that... Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, it did. Well, did you understand that the, the legislative body uh, created this grant program in order to provide food to the people of Guam? That's correct. Is it fair to say the people that the Guam legislature thought that it was necessary for those people to get the food? I agree, and, and the Department of Public Health agrees to that well, as well. Okay, so, and I appreciate that. For two years now, the, the money, the expenditures have been languishing. Uh, do you think it would be a, that uh, the emergency is over now, that we don't need to carry forward in that program? You know, I think there's always a need to get food available to indigent populations and employed folks would you, and I children. hope you can recognize our frustration and the, and the speaker's frustration. We all recognize the necessity of mm -hmm. eating, and we all uh, recognize... Uh, the, the catastrophe of being poor and unable to feed your family. And it seems to me that the Guam legislature stepped up and said, here's $5 million, please go feed the people. And would you agree that you haven't done that yet? I would agree that the process has not taken place. I share the same passion that we're trying to get food into people's mouths. I do know that the money was not made available in March of 2021, mm -hmm. uh, but we have moved forward since it was made available, I think, in June of 2022. Okay, now the grant, uh, the application for the grant, did you follow uh, the, essentially the, the procurement law model for soliciting applications? We did a public service announcement, and based on that, uh, we took the applicants that responded. They had to meet the criteria of being a nonprofit organization. Okay. Could you tell us who those, well, uh, let me, I see that on July 25th of 2022, a deadline was, sent, was set for grant applications, uh, and generally the rule in the, uh, in the world of procurement is if you don't get your uh, application through the door by a date, you're dead. Why did you extend for four days the deadline extension? Because there weren't very many people who responded, so we wanted to give them an opportunity. How many had responded? Total of seven. Well, how many had responded by July 25th? Oh, Carlos, do you know how, how many responded by July 25th? <clears throat> I, I don't remember exactly, but I think it was probably four or five. Four or five. So four or five people by the established deadline had a, applied for grants? Like I said, I don't remember exactly. Um, um, roughly but, four or five? Yeah, it, I would. If I can recall correctly, there were probably four or five at okay. that time before the extension. No, was made. Um, okay. By July 25th, the established deadline, um, uh, you had received four or five, maybe three, uh, mm -hmm. maybe six. I don't know. Uh, applications for the grant program, and then you extended it for four days up until the 29th. Did you receive any applications between the 25th and the 29th? Yeah. Yeah, who, we did. who did you receive those applications from? Uh, um, did you want me to give you by name who yes, these people yes. are? May I, may I just ask, and maybe mm -hmm. just for some procurement? Um, yeah, that, I don't I, think I don't, that, I don't, I, our, mm. thank you, but I don't think, uh, I understand where you're going with okay. your concern, but I don't think it applies. Do you know, tell me the names of the people who applied for the grant between the 25th and the 29th. I don't recall what the order was. The what? I don't know. I don't. I don't remember the order. I don't remember exactly which organizations applied mm -hmm. between the 25th and the 29th. I can give you names, though, that I do remember okay. of the seven that that did apply. Please do. Um, 
Senator, it's just an active procurement and it hasn't been signed yet, so mm -hmm. I'm just using, as, asking for caution of yeah, I understand the procurement law, and I thank you for uh, you bringing that to our attention, but surely we could find the same information if we have to submit a FOIA to your department or perhaps a subpoena. Right, but do you recall the that names? we don't, Senator? Do you please, do you recall the names of the individuals who had made applications? Um, one would probably... Uh, well, was Todu Guam one of them? You know, our, our Senator, I know you asked me to pause. Our only concern is we just don't want to compromise the procurement and then find ourselves having to restart the process. I don't see, I uh, don't understand I, that. Because if you do ask us for it, I, my understanding of the procurement, and you're probably better at this than I am, Senator, but um, we don't give information until it's settled and, and then it's awarded. That's when we can disclose, is what I understood. Again, maybe you... Well, I, I notice that as of December 22, you have drafted four ag agreements for four separate organizations. Uh, there's a couple questions there. Um, in November of 2022, you had just done the template for the grant agreement, uh, which would have been, what, 18, 19 months after the program started. Is there any particular reason that you hadn't uh, begun to establish the necessities for the program? I'm sorry, what was the question? Yeah, why didn't you, uh, your grant agreement wasn't drafted until November 22, why? Uh, well, from my perspective, I wasn't the division head at the time. Mm -hmm. I didn't start this acting position until August, but what I can tell you was that as soon as the funds were loaded, mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of pressure on us to act quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not an expert on procurement, uh, but what I do know is that these are nonprofit organizations and that we had this money available. We were, we were just basically advised that this is the law and that you have to give it to people that, organizations that are one, number one nonprofit and have an experience mm -hmm. in providing food. Mm -hmm. um, and my understanding is that the applicants that did apply you know, almost all of them, except for one, had that experience. Okay, and which was that? I'm sorry? Who was that? Which, that didn't? You said, yeah, you said only one had the experience? Uh, I'm not sure it's appropriate for me to say the name, but I can tell you this is a, a, this is a, a provider of sorts, not necessarily a, a nonprofit in the conventional sense that what, do, what does that mean? Uh, yeah. It, it, it's, a, it, it's a facility. It's like a, a, a facility that provides health care okay. services. Which, GMH? Um, FHP? Yeah, it could be, mm. I suppose. Okay, and I'm gonna, I guess I'll uh, wrap this up pretty quickly here, but... Um, uh, are you refusing to divulge the names? Well, a couple more questions, I'm sorry. Did the Department of Public Health and Social Services, including uh, the director himself, did you receive any direction from anyone uh, not within your organization to move the deadline extension from July 25th to July 29th? Well, there are three of us. Um, I actually I get the final end of all of this. Uh, Deputy Director Terry and Carlos have been working on this. Uh, prior to that, as Carlos rec um, shared, it was actually Tess, who is now retired. And to your question, Senator, no, I did receive no direction to extend. Actually, that was independent in a recommendation and carried through by Deputy Director Terry, and no direction on my end was received. Okay, fair enough. I heard you use the... Uh I heard you use a personal pronoun. What about you, sir? Did you receive any direction from anybody? No, sir, I did not. Do you know if anybody in public health received direction from anybody to move the deadline from the 25th to the 29th? Absolutely not. It wasn't brought to my attention. Okay, it wasn't brought to your attention? It was well, not okay. mentioned. Well, my curiosity is if you had received perhaps as many as six applications by the 25th, but more likely four or five, uh, why in the world did you think it was necessary to extend the deadline to allow more applicants into the pool? 
Because we didn't receive uh, six or seven by the, by the first we, cutoff. We hear that you uh, received perhaps four or five. Yeah, so we will con confirm that number. Um, well, do you believe that number to be true? I believe it to be fair, okay. whether to be true. Okay. Well, with that fair number, why did you think it was necessary to essentially open the uh, process again? Yeah. Well, at that time, we knew the budget was around 3.1. And by having just a small group of applicants, you know, there are other organizations that are out there that perhaps just needed to hear about this offer, this, this project. So we wanted to make sure that we re-announced it. I, I think that's very fair, too. You, you're trying to, to reach out and be able to make this available. Did you, uh, did you contact anyone to let them know that this... Uh... No, I, I, my understanding is that I had to work through the public service announcement. I didn't contact any individual organization or say, heads up, you guys should apply. So I didn't do any it, of that. Was it just coincidental then that a few people had missed the deadline on the 25th? Thank God. On the, it's open for four more days, and now we can submit our package. It was just, you think it was coincidental? Well, I think it was good public service announcement and them having eyes on it, but uh, I couldn't think that it would be any more than that. Okay, I don't mean to badger you or anything. That's but fine. Do you think that it I was, appreciate the question. Do you think it was incumbent upon potential bidders or applicants uh, to meet the original deadline? And having failed to do so, they were out of luck. That's the way procurement works. I, I don't. I don't think it's an uncommon practice to be able to extend a deadline uh, for certain things. To me, getting food into the mouths of children, I'd like to get more nonprofit out there, organizations out there, to have that opportunity. I've been part of nonprofits for many years, so whenever there's something like this that that they can participate in and give back to the community, uh, you know, I would be all over this. I, okay. you know, so I think it's just an opportunity, okay. but. We didn't in any way seek out any particular nonprofit organization to move this effort forward. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. you uh, your department, I think, can anticipate a FOIA uh, for these application packages. Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you, too. Thank you, Senator. I'm also, well, we're hoping that if this is um, completed in March, that uh, then all the questions will be very or the answers will be very apparent. Of course, any other delays are going to just add on additional questions, but thank you. Senator Barnett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's very frustrating and disappointing what we're hearing when uh, this body sees a need in the community, right? And the need at that time was that uh, people were out of work, they were struggling, they were hungry. You keep talking about hungry children, uh, but yet we waited a whole year. Uh, the money didn't come for a whole year. So I, I have to ask you, Director, did you, was there any communication between yourself and, and BBMR when it took a year to get the money? Uh, there is communication, and that's actually how we ended up with the funds in at 3.1, and then it was loaded right. after yeah. that. So when you communicated and you got the $3.1 million, was there any communication to tell uh, Mr. Carlson, I presume, at BBMR that you had been shorted? Yes, there was, and um, I, I have that email. I, I have that what well. was his response? Oh, that's it. We're going to get the 3.1. Did you express to Mr. Carlson how passionate uh, you guys were when it comes to feeding the hungry children? Yes, yes we are passionate. Uh, there is an explanation that I need to get back with you on. Uh, it is probably going to involve Director Byrne because it's about the sale of the bond and, and how you interpret that. And so I got to get that, those details from them. They're, they're the experts on that. I, I don't want to talk about bond sales and revenues and and what's it left, because 3.1 supposedly now is really what is available. Um, so I'll, I'll get that from the two, what I mentioned to the speaker, I'll reach out to both directors and ask them for something in written form that I can present to you. Uh, to like I said, this is, it's very frustrating, disappointing to hear this, but I think the only saving grace is that our, our people are still struggling um, with food insecurity. Uh, we're struggling with the you know, rising cost of living, with inflation, so I think, again, that, that we might have missed um, the intent of this legislation, which, you know, Speaker Terlahi was, um, well, very wise to, to introduce, and we missed that opportunity. But again, it's um, kind of a blessing that our people are still hurting because we, they need this aid. Yes, they do. And so yeah. can, can we march for real? Can we march for real? You mean can are we, we hurt and launch this thing? Are we talking about that the people are going to get this aid by March? Absolutely. We're going to move it 
forward and work with the team. I'm not putting March into stone, but I will say this, that's what's on the vision. I just would, I just, I would just would like to be comforted in knowing that there was a real effort to track this money down when, when this body does things like anticipate the needs of our people and crafts legislation and laws that address these needs. And I just want to know that there wasn't any foot dragging or, uh, you know, reluctance to engage with the administration uh, to get these, these much needed funds. Uh, no foot dragging. I that I observe or notice from my deputy, he was on this, and with regards to resistance, we did ask, we got the money, we asked that that was all that we were gonna get, and we said yes, and I'll just need to talk with the two directors to provide that detail, more of an explanation about the sell of the bonds, and how that translates to revenue that we could have access for this program. But do you think that uh, two years is too long? It is a lot more protracted than I would prefer, but we are moving forward. And if you look at where we are today with the emergency allotment expiring in February, it's almost, although it, it is much longer than we had all anticipated, Speaker, uh, it also, it's kind of very timely when the cost of eggs are going up, the cost of food is going up. You now have a program that's going to roll out this coming months, in a few months, and it'll help offset the cost of food acquisition for our right. families. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, it's, it's, it's sad because they needed it then, and, and it we kinda, need it more now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Senator. Any questions on this item? Senator? Senator Brown. I don't know what more to add, Madam Speaker. I mean, it's obviously a sense of where it shows the challenges within government to really execute where there's a real need. I mean, I think we all remember, and even I have to tell you during the pandemic, my own surprise to the amount of people that were waiting in line for hours and hours. I remember coming down Nimitz Hill um, and how backed up they were up that road to get the most basic of commodities. And on the surface, maybe it doesn't seem that our people are in need, but are. you really realize there are a lot of people out there that are very dependent. And I don't know what it is that we need to do to facilitate the wheels, but, but this is a situation where, where you know, the, the bureaucracy of government really gets in the way of executing what the desired outcome was. And I do recall, Madam Speaker, how incredibly passionate you were uh, with regards to addressing this need in the community. And I don't know how we address it differently. I mean, we're in this situation where we definitely want to see things to move, uh, but I don't think we can, we can simply conduct this as if it was a regular piece of legislation, another mechanism within government. It was a sense of urgency. And I agree with, you know, Senator Barnett, at least hopefully we can still get it out there because I'll tell you, when you see, you know, a carton of eggs rise with almost $3 within a few days, uh, you know, there's a need out there, and, and I hope we can finally follow through, even though it didn't come at a time when the most critical need was there. So I'm sure you, I think we've reiterated the point, but I do have to point out, Madam Speaker, I'm, I'm happy to hear the engagement that we're having with public health, because this isn't the kind of conversation I haven't heard for quite some time in the Guam legislature, so I certainly appreciate the dialogue this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Just one type degree. Yeah, I just am asking if um, our, if you can provide us a report in the next week on how far we are with this uh, project in in one week's time. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Senator. And thank you for the for the energy on this. I do know that that from the time the bill passed until the time the money was available, 15 months had lapsed. So we share the urgency. We do see the numbers, perhaps not just in the food lines, but just the sheer numbers of people that come in and apply for, food, for the SNAP program, the previous uh, food stamp program. So we do share this passion. It has been a process. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, we're gonna move on now to the D Division of Children's Wellness, Bureau of Social Services Administration and Child Protective Services presentation. Uh, I, I will... Uh, thank you again for that presentation and, and for all your work uh, after the huge crisis that we face. And actually, we know this was a crisis that was ongoing for many, many years. It did not occur at one point. It occurred over many years. So thank you for all your work, all of you. And uh, to uh, DYA, of course, staff who also assisted. And um, so you said at, at the bottom of this one table that as of uh, January 30, all referrals have been assigned to the crisis or investigation unit. Uh, does assigned, um, being assigned give us confidence that they've actually been investigated or are, have been looked at to see the urgency and prioritized for investigation? Yes, we're confirming that. All right. And um, 
uh, you're confident then that with your current staffing, you're able to get to those on a timely manner? No, we are still short on staffing though. We are um, current, we're still on active recruitment. We are looking, we are desperate actually for more social workers for our, for our direct service side from social workers, um, community program aides, and even homemakers. They're the ones that go out in the field. They're, they're the ones doing services for our children. So yes, we still need more staff. Um, the delay on what would happen is because of the shortage of staff, though we're vet, vetting all cases coming in, the referrals, it may be a delay in processing like documentation, the administrative side, um, applying for Medicaid or SNAP or childcare. But we are, our team has come together to try to push out as much as we can and then onboarding new staff like the, our community program aides, they're coming in shortly. That. Um, they'll be able to assist us in those efforts. All right, so I know that part of the executive order declaring an emergency under, uh, for this is uh, allowed this authority for ex hiring, right? And so yes. you have utilized this, you're saying, to the full extent, and that it's just a matter of uh, still processing or a matter of we're unable to recruit. We have active recruitment at DOA sitting. We just don't have a pool of social workers, so there is no classified there's no certified listing. So though we need more social workers, we're not finding a pool of them applying at DOA. All right. So that's the hold up right now. I appreciate that. This is what you have been consistently reporting. Correct. So I appreciate the consistency in this response and that uh, we've also recognized this need in trying to redirect the priorities of the University of Guam and their social work scholarships and making sure that those are happening. We know that there is actually a shortage of social workers needed across the government. So, so uh, this is just a shout out, I guess, to people looking at fields to get into. This is one great need and great rewards I, I have heard from all of those. And thank you to you who worked in this field. All right, um, to, for the Guba Mina Asi shelter for children, this is uh, one of the shelters. We have other shelters for children. But uh, I was interested in this one particular shelter because during COVID it had been completed, but it wasn't opened right away. It, it turned into other uses during COVID. So now I'm glad to hear it's operating. You've got staffing in there. You are able to house, uh, sorry, you said 25, 26? Currently we have 28. 28 children. And um, that, that's good and bad news. Good news in that we were able to house more than six because we passed the law to expand the capacity when this beautiful shelter was built it was really only going to house six but we allowed the director to waive uh, and allow more than six when there is a need so thank you director if that's been done and um, for all those who are working there um, 26 children of course is, is just not a good thing for our community to have that many children but um, we're going to continue to work in that regard to take all these children out of poverty and do what we need to do so that we don't face this situation. But um, when you said working with Guam Memorial Health to place children with special health care needs at skilled nursing, do you mean Guam Memorial Hospital? Yes, I, okay. I needed to correct that. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure. And then um, uh, it says the IFB invitation for bid will be submitted for contract services, meaning we're gonna outsource this now, the operations and the management or staffing of, of this facility outsource. That's what we do with our current children's shelter, the Ali Children's Shelter, the Ali Women's Shelter, the Guma San Jose. Correct. Okay, so I understand that. When do you expect to do that and what will happen to the 20 BALSA staff that are currently there? Okay. Um the staffing there are currently limited term appointments. Mm. Um, so if, um, if it's put out on contract, there is a possibility if maybe the contract work, whoever is the vendor could pick them up because they're already skilled and trained. Um, another thing is some of them may be able to come down to Bolsa to assist with our daily um, needs there. Um, like I said, there's a, um, transportation for, because in total we have 642 children under foster care. So we're only directing it right now at the home for this uh, right. briefing today. Yes. But there are still other services that need to happen daily. So mm -hmm. um, a lot of them are placed at our foster families, our licensed foster families. 
we are at capacity. Every day we, cha we are challenged with, yes. with trying to find placement for our kids. Yes. So that, that explains the, the higher number at the shelter. Yes. So we understand that on all levels that is a crisis. And, um, but for the IFB, I'm just trying to follow up on this because I'm surprised it didn't happen right away. So when is, do you expect this to happen? I have my team working on it. We're shooting to um, send it out by next week. And then when do you expect it to be completed? Mm -hmm. With the procurement process? Um. Yeah, uh, speaker, this is just um, one of those items that we're going through the procurement process, so it may take anywhere, maybe three to six months, depending on the review process. Uh, it's sent to GSA, it's announced through GSA, but it also perhaps will require a review of the AG's office, depending on um, what GSA does when we submit the requisition, because it will be over 500,000 in terms of uh, procurement activity. Because it'll be a multi-year contract as well. Multi-year. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions regarding this uh, CPS or uh, Senator Taitikui? Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Speaker. Um, with regards to the, an article that was put out, um, the 900 plus referrals to CPS were backlogged. You remember that article? I believe it was 2021 um, that was brought to our attention. We. It, it mentioned there that uh, you needed an additional social workers, but when I look at your, your staffing uh, and operations section here, your recruitment of only um, one social worker, three. Um, the CPA, what is CPA certified? It's I'm sorry, so, so you're looking at staffing for only the shelter, okay? Versus uh, overall? Yes. Okay. Correct. Okay. So. You are now, I mean, based on, on the article here, it mentioned that you needed 14 additional uh, social workers. What is the status on that now? We but have, um, well, there are 11 new at our, at our bureau, but okay. these are unclassified. Okay. So we are, like I said, at DOA, we have currently eight um, classified positions um, pending a certified listing for, for recruitment. But we do have 11 unclassifieds. Um, we've told all our staff to apply so they can have that chance to go through the competitive process for classification. Okay, you said eight, so is that a total of 19? Well, or you said 11, 11 are unclassified. Unclassified, and, and then, then, but we have eight classified um, recruitment packets at DOA. Okay, and what is the total amount of your, your wish list? I mean, <laughs> Being realistic, our, our um, wishes, I think it was like 13 that we were looking at. 13? For, un for social workers. For social, 13? Yes. Okay, and currently, again, only eight, and then you've added 11 unclassified. Correct. So that's above the 13 you're yeah. requesting for, correct? Well, that's good news. Yes. That's good news. <laughs> Hallelujah, something good in here. Okay, the other thing I had was the, um, you know, based on the emergency executive order 2021-20, with regards to the governor's um, using, utilizing DYA to assist you, where are we at at that, at that juncture? DYA is still a great part of um, uh, overseeing this area. So currently the role of uh, Department of Youth Affairs under uh, Director Lonnie Williams, uh, they're no longer actually in that same capacity with okay. Child Protective Services. Okay. Uh, we so appreciate their, their intervention and their support, okay. but we've revolved to the point where now Protective Services uh, is, is functioning fully. Okay. We, we do have guidance from them. They did uh, visit us recently saying that uh, they do have staff uh, on the side that can come in, and actually we've moved forward in saying that we appreciate that support and, and may work forward with it. Okay, when, when, when did that stop? You know, when DYA was no longer needed, when, when did that end? It's, it's there it in our um, down transition on August, August 8. 8. Oh, I'm sorry, there was two talking sorry, at the sorry. same time. Go ahead, go ahead, they go transitioned ahead. out of both on August 8, 2022. August 2022, okay. correct. Thank you. Um, Pending referrals, all pending referrals with, with who? Okay. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you. It's good news on that part. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator. Senator Barnett. Or sorry, Sen Senator Fisher, my apologies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before I get uh, actually to a question, I've been working uh, one way or another with uh, CPS for over 30 years uh, in the Superior Court and uh, elsewhere, and I've come to learn uh, that it is one of the 
single most difficult jobs in uh, all of government of Guam, and you are remarkably underpaid for the work you do. I don't know if people are aware of the fact that your social workers uh, frequently are receiving telephone calls at midnight or later and have to go out to a facility to take care of a child, and frequently your social workers are spending their own money to make sure that the child has clean pampers, that the child has food, milk, etc. And um, uh, with, without a doubt, you folks go above and beyond. So I would like to congratulate you. And if it if were in my authority, I would, uh, I, you're, you would see a remarkable increase in the compensation that you receive. So congratulations on your dedication. Senator, um, may I add, I, I, it's my understanding that one of the PACE studies that is going to take place is supposed to be for social workers. This has been discussed over the years now, but uh, my understanding when I followed up is that that should occur Good. subsequent Good. to this pay increase across the board. Well, I'm very glad to hear that, and I can, without even seeing the amount, I can say that it's still inadequate. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to congratulate you and thank you, and I just want the people of Guam to be aware of what it is that you folks actually do. So thank you. Um, staffing and operations, I noticed that you're going for, uh, it looks like you're going to be pushing out an invitation for bid. With this sort of uh, job description, what needs to be done, do you think that an invitation for bid is appropriate or should it be a request for proposals? Because this sounds like professional services to me. Uh, because I wouldn't want you guys to think that, oh, we got, you know, we got this person, they're not so good, but they were low bidder. You know, I mean, these are, I don't know, I've just, okay. I'm not asking for, I guess I'm not asking for an answer to that. I'm just hoping that you would either consider an RFP or doing a multi-step um, so you can get rid of the clearly inadequate. But, yes. okay, that being said, I wanted to ask you um, a lot of the, uh, um, if a child is born at the hospital and is positive for crystal methamphetamine, does CPS step in? I'll have Crystal answer that. Okay. So a lot of times if a child does test positive, right, we're already receiving a referral and a call from GMH. So somebody is already responding immediately. Okay. Um, because of the new changes to the Child Protective Act, right, now we have to really look at reasonable efforts with our families. Mm. So um, we do really talk with our AGs about um, the, the circumstances and severity of the child's health, right? Because mm. the number one thing is the safety of the child. So depending on that, um, we can then decide whether or not we're going to exert temporary legal custody or we're going to work with the family and make okay. sure that they're connected with services. So, so, um, the, so you guys have to use your best professional judgment to determine whether or not it's appropriate that the child remain with the family or you take temporary custody? Through our... In, so through our um, interviews and d um, gathering all the facts, right, especially when it comes to medical stuff, we really do um, we I'm so sorry. So we actually do consult and gather a lot of the medical documents before we make a determination, right, okay. with what route we're going to do with our children. Um, Yes, we have, we actually do have a lot of high exertion rates in regards to our children. As you can see, we have um, the 642. Mm -hmm. So I know when we have been talking to our federal counterparts, they did say that we have a very high exertion rate compared to others what, in the what, I'm sorry, what's the assertion? Exertion rate. So okay, these are the is, children, these are the children under temporary legal custody of CPS. Okay. So they are wards of the state. Um, what they would like to see is a more preventive um, approach where we're trying to work with these families before exerting legal custody on them, right? Now, um, we have such a high rate. Is it fair to say that that's because of uh, the prevalence of crystal methamphetamine on the island? So we do work a lot with um, drug use. So there is a very high drug use. So drug use is more of a risk factor than a maltreatment. So depending on the maltreatment that's coming in through the referral, we can determine whether or not we're going to actually do an exertion on a child or children or, or the, of those families, right? 
Um, how many, I hope I'm using the right phrase again, but of the exertions that you do, how many of them would you estimate are related to the use of crystal meth? I actually do not have that data mm -hmm. on me right now um, to provide you a number of how is it, many. Is it, is it rare or quite a bit or? It, rare, no. Okay. We actually work a lot with um, a lot of families that have substance use issues. Um, we are constantly, um, we actually work very closely with the Guam Family Recovery Program in regards to these families once we exert children. So um, the intention is really to try and work and reunify with all our children, right? Okay, uh, thank you for your answers. And uh, Madam Speaker, if you just allow me to thank and congratulate the department again. Thank you so much, Senator. Senator Barnett. Thank you. Um, Ma'am, I just wanted to ask, uh, just looking at these numbers, um, very alarming, right? So 2020, 1,142 cases, 21, 1,089, FY22, 1,672, uh, and then you're projecting 1,650 uh, cases, and all the numbers um, just on the rise. Right. And so yes. just to kind of expand on what attorney, uh, well, attorney Fisher, I mean, Senator Fisher's <laughs> line of questioning, what would you say? And I'm not asking for specifics, but just generalities based on because you guys are, you know, out there boots on the ground. What would you say are the major contributing factors to the increases in these numbers? So what we've seen really is there are multiple referrals coming in on various different things and we see a lot of different trends so um, I know that we're seeing a lot more families who are taking care of children <clears throat> and these are relatives right so these relatives are caring for these children but they don't have legal documents so we're seeing more cases like that and hopefully we can increase in trying to work with these families to seek out these services um, to try and prevent us to actually exerting custody so that they could gain these legal documents. Um, I know that that's one of the things that we wanted to try and explore and try and see um, working with the AGs as to how can we better serve the families on this island without having to burden our system, right? Because there's so many, um, so many referrals that are coming in and we want to make sure that we're doing our reasonable efforts with each of our families that we're working with. Of the exertions, how many uh, times, or just, I guess, again, generally speaking, how many times are these children reunited with uh, their families? So, unfortunately, over the past couple years that I've been working at CPS, um, I have been seeing a lot more um, cases that are going into permanency rather than reunification. Um, I don't know if it's just because of the the services are not being available or perhaps we're not working um, our approaches with trying to motivate our parents for reunification um, is not effective enough, but we are trying our best to try and work towards reunification as much as possible. I do know that a lot of times, a lot of the challenges are lack of transportation, um, a lot of challenges are lack of housing. So a lot of our families don't have adequate housing to ensure that the children and family are in a home. Um, many of our families are on wait lists for housing programs. Uh, Ma'am, you've been in the business a long time, right? So I, I wanna ask, um, and again, these numbers that just boggle my mind when we hear we have 600 plus children in foster care, when we see the numbers uh, continue to rise at Gumat Mina Aussi. So what is it? What are you seeing that's different over the last uh, three years that maybe wasn't in, in play before? I just want to clarify first. <laughs> um, I am, um, I'm the acting chief as of January 2022. I have experience working with the TANF program and the SNAP program for previous years. But in my many years of working with I'm public sure you've health, seen some things. I, yes, I've seen some things. Um, in 
more recent with dealing with cases. I do hear, yes, there is a lot more with, that are dealing with um, families with using drugs. Um, and there's a lot more abuse. The cases are more um, severe and the families are larger and the case is just more complicated. There's multiple facets that are happening at one time. So um, there's a lot, there's a, it's not a one-way approach in order to help these families. There's, we have to come at different angles, and that's why um, partnering with DYA um, and also with um, Guam Behavioral Health, um, a team approach is, is our best course for action right now. And, and you know, I, I will add to that too. Uh, you know, as, since, as Speaker pointed out, that this has been an ongoing issue as far as cases not being addressed as well as they should be. And I think just the fact that we have really attack the whole approach to vetting referrals to protective services and making sure that every one of them are appropriate uh, to the program and that they're uh, acted upon within a reasonable time frame. And I think that makes the huge difference as to also the, the numbers that are out there. So that, and then I agree, you know, you've got substance abuse, you've got substance abuse both by the mother and the father. Uh, so it's really hard to have a, have a uh, supportive person within the family. So then that justifies even more so why a child would be removed or put into relative placement. You had said something, I believe it was Crystal, had talked about um, extended families, right? The more tradition of Pokusai, right? I mean, I was Pokusai by uh, close relatives, uh, you know, throughout my childhood. Uh, but I've heard of many situations where you have... Uh, the extended or even immediate family uh, stepping up to fill a need, whether you know the mother or the father is um, in jail or you know strung out on, on crystal meth. Um, but I also hear that these families they they step up and they take care of these kids, but like you said, they don't have the legal documents. And so I've heard of many cases where these these children who are happy where they are are you know ripped from the clutches of their family and placed into the system. What can we do to uh, prevent that from happening? Or what advice do you give to those uh, families that, that want to help, but you know, maybe don't know how to navigate the system? Yeah. So unfortunately, I know in some of the cases that we've seen, right, there have been situations where there's, there's conflict because there's just so many um, law offices that can afford, um, provide, services without having to pay out so much, right? Because everything has a cost. And perhaps these families can't afford to um, hire an attorney and pay out the court um, costs to get these legal guardianships in place. Or perhaps these, <clears throat> I'm sorry, perhaps these um, offices have a conflict and they can't provide that type of service to these families. Um, I know that I have been speaking with my with the social service supervisors, and um, I know one of the, the suggestions was to reach out to one of our um, one of the law offices to see how can we help these families and have some kind of partnership with them, just so that they could receive these services instead of us having to exert on these families. It's a very uh, uncomfortable subject, right? But I yeah. think that, that the level of awareness maybe is reflected by the increase of, of reporting that we're seeing over uh, the last few years, right? Uh, you know, a speaker had mentioned a, a shout out to those people who want to get into uh, social work, right? And it's one of these fields we see so many uh, fields in the government of Guam who are suffering from whether it be, uh, you know, a GDOE, um, staff that service students with special needs, or in this case, uh, you know, social work with uh, public health, the people who are right on the front line of this uh, very alarming battle that we're fighting, right? So why social work? Uh, for the people watching, uh, just, if you could share with us, what is rewarding about the work that you guys do? So I can only attest for my own experience, right? So um, I am a person that likes to help and give back to the community. That was my goal when I was going to college. Uh, for some reason, I found myself in social work. And um, going into the field, it was very rewarding when you actually see the reunification happen. Because um, we see families at their lowest point in time, right? And it is challenging, 
um, for that journey. Sometimes there's most of the times there are battles that we lose as far as like reunification, but then we see children in stable homes, in a loving fostering home, and they thrive in those situations, right? So even just a guardianship or an adoption is great. The, the ones that are difficult are the children that still remain in the system as long-term fosters, where they don't have that permanency and they're still very young. It becomes very difficult when children are in the system at 10 years old, 11 years old, and we can't find any family placements, we can't find, I mean, we do our best to seek out family first and then move outwards, right? So if they have a Nina or a Nino, we're, we're trying to explore those options. Or if there's close family friends that the, the children are close with, or former foster parents that used to um, provide a safe home for them, but they ended up having to leave off island, but then had expressed that they still want to be that permanent home, right? When a child is actually in a permanent home and they're out of the system is very rewarding. Unfortunately, we have so many children that, have, that are still in long-term foster and we just can't find a permanent home for them. How many times does uh the economic situation of a family that, that wants to help out in a situation of this, an impediment. Um, because I know to become a foster parent, you need you know, to have a certain amount of bedrooms, right, for you know, maybe children of, of differing uh, sexes. So I've heard you know, a lot of times where you have these, these families, again, who want to step up and they, they want to help, but they can't because, you know, like many of our people, they're, they're poor and they can't meet those, those guidelines. So how many times is that an impediment to um, a happy ending for these cases? So there are a lot of families that our children are placed with where they are not licensed, but we've vetted them out. They become a non-relative placement, right? Um, so what we end up doing is we go to court and we actually request for these court orders of foster care payments. And we have seen a lot of court ordered foster care payments. So if um, a lot of times that's, that's the biggest struggle, right, is paying out the amount of foster care payments every month to all these families that have opened up their homes. And then um, we're just exerting big families, a lot more children. Unfortunately, we can't keep a lot of our children together. Um, they're always separated, which makes it a lot more difficult working the cases, right? So um, if we are always asking for money, it's always to increase our foster care payments because of the need to care for these children because we just don't have enough licensed foster homes. Can you just share with us more information on, uh, let's say, uh, people watching or anybody in this room wants to become a foster parent, uh, what are the, the rates of compensation for Senator that? Senator Barnett, if I could, uh, I have to interrupt, I'm sorry. Uh, we have to reset the audio, so we're going to take a three-minute break right now to reset the audio. Thank you. 